صباح الخير Good morning everybody Good morning ladies and gentlemen بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم um, Welcome to the second day of the fourth German Jordanian workshop uh, which has actually started yesterday at the University of Jordan so it's a continuation today uh, what we have started yesterday um, the topic of this workshop uh, today, uh, this year, as you hear, is the fourth workshop at this frame. Uh, the topic of this workshop is the implementation of CSP technologies and solar uh, applications in Jordan. The CSP technology, as many of you know, is uh, um, solar thermal power plants technology, um, which has a good potential for implementation in this region of the world. Many of you have heard uh, about the desert concept, about the um, uh, su supply of electricity from the desert to all urban uh, centers in the main region, and a portion of what uh, would be in, um, um, generated in the desert to Europe. So um, uh, we will concentrate on, the, on this topic this time this year, and once again, you are welcome. So, Today um, uh, we have about, uh, I think, nine um, lectures, uh, different topics actually, uh, varies from uh, CSP technologies to other applications of renewable energy, including project implementation uh, techniques and so on. Uh, the first um, presentation or first lecture um, uh, uh, will be um, uh, presented or made by Professor uh, Muhammad Hamdan from Azaytun University uh, on CSP uh, dish sealing systems. It's uh, a kind of technology, of CSP technology. Um, uh, Professor Muhammad Hamdan is uh, the Dean of Engineering uh, Faculty at Azaytun University here. Uh, he obtained his PhD from uh, the USA from Washington State University and um, his research interests are concentrated in renewable energy, alternative fuels, and he has over um, 95 publications in these fields. So please, uh, Professor uh, Hamdan, you have the ground. Thank you, Dr. Lai, for the introducing me. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, first of all, I would like to welcome you all the campus of Azaytuni University. Uh, I'll start, allow me to give you a very quick uh, note about Azaytuni University. It was established in 1992, uh, almost 20 years ago, uh, with a few hundred students. And now it has uh, six faculties, uh, engineering uh, one of them, which is the newest actually. It was established only three years ago. Uh, the total number of the universities, the maximum capacity a private university can take, which is all uh, about 8,000 students. Uh, engineering faculty has uh, four different departments. Uh, electrical engineering, which is co concentrates on communication and computer. Uh, we have architecture department, we have civil and infrastructure engineering, and we have mechanical engineering. Uh, currently, we have almost 400 students in the Faculty of Engineering. Okay, after this introduction of, uh, about the Zaytu University, we start with my presentation, which is solar dish technology. Uh, we are sorry for the late start, but we, start, we hope we'll make up the delay. So I promise the chairman to finish in 20 minutes. <laughs> The term is solar dish technology. I will be talking about introduction to the dish sterling systems, uh, its components, collector, receiver, sterling engine, or heat engine, and then efficiency consideration. As an introduction, uh, the, this system, dish, uh, dish engine system, converts solar radiation, which comes from the sun. Uh, through different conversion and finally we can get electrical energy after it is converted into thermal and mechanical energy. Uh, it has three main components. It has a collector, which will be discussed in more detail, receiver and the engine itself. 
Okay, as an application for solar energy, this system is almost the oldest voucher system used uh, back in the 19th century. And this is the photograph of the system which was used these ages. It was uh, uh, invented by the Swedish-American inventor Megan Erickson. As we can see in this picture, it has almost the three components, the collector, receiver, and the engine. Uh, of course, it has been modified this time, and then people start to concentrate on the system back in the early 70s, when we have the first uh, jump in the cost of crude oil uh, prices, so people start to look for other sources of energy. Uh, the system, biggest system nowadays, it produces between 5 to 25 kilowatts of electricity. Uh, this makes it very useful to be used in domestic purposes because it, is, it produces a uh, little amount of electrical energy. Uh, also, it is, uh, if we use it in domestic purposes, we can the excess. Can, uh, I mean, it is, there is no need to, go, to be on grid of the grid applications. <coughs> uh, as we see here, we need a, a large number of parameters to produce almost 450 kilowatts. In, 19, in, in sorry, 2010, uh, 1.5 megawatt uh, dish was in, in Arizona. In Arizona. Uh, a nominal maximum direct, uh, this is, gives an idea about the, the size of the system. If the solar intensity, direct normal intensity around 1,000 watt, watt per meter square, so this is value, it's typical value here in Jordan during summer, uh, like June, July, August, then to produce 25 kilowatt, we need a dish of almost 10 meters quite large. This is a typical issue we're talking about. Uh, we can combine them together to produce a certain amount of electricity as we want. Okay, now we go to the main components. It's a collector. Of course, it should be a parabolic collector in such a way the incident solar radiation will be collected and focused on a certain point to increase the maximum uh, radiation incident on, this, on that point. Uh, the receiver, uh, as I mentioned, should be located on or very near the focal point, of the, fo the focus of the receiver to maximize the incident energy on this point because this system works under high temperature. So if we focus the solar radiation on that point, we can get maximum temperature. So, uh, what, it, what actually, the, the, how it works, uh, the heat is transferred to the heat engine, as I will mention later, the mechanism, where it is converted into mechanical energy, and the mechanical energy is converted somehow into electrical energy. Uh, we need additional components, of course, like tracking system to track the sun during the day. Uh, also, we need a control system. Typical temperature is around 800 degrees. Uh, regarding the efficiency, maximum efficiency oh. achieved by such, such a system is 30%. We'll talk about the efficiency later on. Uh, under typical conditions, they have an average solar uh, uh, sorry, uh, efficiency between 16 and 25%. Okay. The collector, once again, from geometrical point of view, it should be the location of parabolic. Parabolic, we have a focal point, and the incentivization is focused or directed to the focal point. And of course, it should be rotating by tracking mechanism to track the sun during the day. Uh, so the receiver usually put on the focal point, placed on the focal point, or near the focal point, they are typical. Uh, the, this one, the upper one, the receiver in the focus point and focal point, but the lower one are near the focus point. 
Okay, we need to talk about the material of the vector. It has the following properties. As a star, it should be characterized by highly reflective surface. All reflectivity should be maximum possible to reflect maximum possible amount of energy. Uh, in a specular uh, fashion, that means almost all incident radiation will be reflected in a certain direction, not diffused uh, reflection. Also, climatic conditions, especially in the Middle East region where we have high temperature in the dust, uh, should the material stand such uh, climatic conditions, otherwise, with time, it will be deteriorated. Uh, the weight also is very important, uh, it should be minimum as much as possible uh, for many reasons, transportation, when we transport it from the manufacturer or the factory to the site, also it will be, it will be easy to have a light weight for the tracking mechanism and this energy consumption. Uh, the materials, uh, usually the receiver made of the following materials, aluminium or stainless steel, uh, as I mentioned, aluminium is a highly reflective polished surface, uh, stainless steel is a polished surface, so it has a maximum uh, reflection, this is if it is not covered by other materials, uh, also it, it, it reflects energy in another specular, specular uh, fashion. Uh, another option to provide a protective service to use backside coated glass mirrors. So, in addition to the uh, stainless steel or uh, aluminium, we use uh, glass, a uh, thin layer of, uh, of glass. Uh, polished silver reaches actually a reflectivity of almost 98%. Also, plastic films are another option in the bearing. A new silver coated plastic film to reach reflectivity of 96%. Also, it is low resistance to mechanical stresses. Now, the structure we have different structure. Either a collector can consist of one large continuous uh, surface, like uh, this one, or it can be uh, another structure uh, like consists of a certain number of uh, segments or assets. Uh, we join them together on the structure as we can see in this uh, When we don't have a continuous structure, we have each face as it has its own curvature and orientation characteristics in accordance to the position within the system. This arrangement should be achieved in order to maximize the reflected amount of energy incident on the structure. At, uh, also, it has advantage that it does not necessarily construct one big parabolic surface. It is much easier in manufacturing the uh, the whole system, instead of having large continuous piece, we can you know, divide it into many pieces and then put them together in another parabolic structure. Uh, here, which is that consists of one continuous uh, surface, can be made of one large piece or they can be composed of different segments that are connected together. Uh, Uh, modern large uh, dishes, the optical and structural elements are already separated from each other. This is all uh, the necessary for you know, uh, uh, installation of the site, transportation, and most important is manufacturing. It's not easy to manufacture a complete parabolic uh, structure. Uh, it's easier to manufacture them in segments and then put them together. Uh, this is when talking about like a larger glass mirror, as I mentioned, it's not easy to manufacture them. Okay, the following figure shows 
shows the different segments, how we manufacture them. Uh, this is This is the structure as a whole, and as you see, we place this glass on position, and here also we complete the whole structures. As you can see, this consists of many or certain number of pieces like this, and put them together to form the whole system. Uh, also, we can do in multi-phase consideration, we structure construction, <coughs> we, this is also possible, okay, as we can see in this, this is, the main, this is the structure itself, and then we start putting the uh, mirror surface in position, and this is also continuity for that. At the end, we get such a Okay, this is another alternative, the uh, Fresnel collector. I think most of us know uh, the Fresnel collector, how it works. It's like a plane mirror arranged together in a polyphilic fashion to uh, form a polyphilic geometry to have maximum reflective energy at that point. Uh, central Fresnel collector replaces polyphilic fish by a number of mirrors, as I just mentioned. Sometimes we, we use secondary concentrator. Uh, this will be more clear when we talk about the receiver itself. There are you know, some energy, reflected energy doesn't go to the receiver, it passes the receiver at the edge. So we use secondary concentrator to reflect the energy into the receiver. So we can increase the fraction of energy that gets into the system. Yeah, this is the figure I mentioned. This is the reflector. It reflects energy. Sometimes, like you can see on this, it doesn't go into the receiver cavity. So we use secondary reflector to reflect the energy inside the cavity. Okay, so we increase the amount of heat into the cavity, as I just mentioned. Uh, unfortunately, it has some disadvantages. This one, it will increase the cost, of course, of the system. Okay, now the receiver. The receiver is in interfacing the reflector or the collector with the engine itself. So actually, what it is doing is uh, Heat uh, as a start in the receiver, the fluid it is being heated as it is absorbed by the uh, reflected energy, and then this heat will be given to the working fluid in the engine to produce mechanical energy as we see in a minute. Important requirements for the Each one has advantages and disadvantages. Uh, the heat loss, especially the relative heat loss of the external, is quite high. Uh, it's okay, so the heat 
rules in the external rules is expected to be much higher than the cavity because it is uh, radiation is directed to the surrounding the atmosphere while it is the cavity uh, the amount of heme was usually reflected inside the cavity so it remains inside the cavity and this is very important property for the receiver so uh, cavity receiver in the country uh, most of the most radiation remains inside the cavity uh, this explains why the cavity maintains most of the heat uh, lost as I mentioned, it would be reflected inside the cavity from cells to another, so it remains almost there. It is almost like a black body. So we will go back to radiation. Black body cavity uh, absorbs maximum energy and reflects or transmits minimum energy because all the energy will be inside this cavity. So uh, this uh, advantage really makes uh, the cavity superior over the external and most people nowadays they are using the cavity receiver instead of the external uh, Cavity receivers has also two types. Uh, direct elimination receivers and uh, usually considered radiation heat directly the working fluid the engine in a condensed tube. Uh, it is the simple range, the simple time, sorry. Uh, the receiver is located 15 centimeters behind the focal point. Uh, the other type is indirect. Uh, the indirect is where the heat receives by a working fluid. Through inter or the heat engine received through intermediate heat transfer fluid. Uh, this is a typical one. So this is the incident radiation which is passes through the cavity. Uh, this is the weak common frame. This is the uh, intermediate fluid, which is a liquid metal for heat transfer uh, properties. Uh, once the radiation incident so that it evaporates and then the vapor will come to the engine the engine works on cycle has a working fluid uh, the sodium here condenses upon condensation it will reduce most of the heat latent heat the working fluid of the engine and then the cycle starts okay, this is explained what I just mentioned uh, should be liquid metal, as I mentioned. Uh, important property for this one, it uh, operates at a constant or uniform temperature, because it depends on evaporation and condensation of the uh, intermediate fluid. So this makes, make, we are making, we are making sure of the operating temperature to avoid other problems. Uh, this, uh, Opposite of the other type, which is the temperature gradient to the cycle, which makes life more complicated. Okay, so in indirect uh, amount of heat transfer is rather high. And uh, now, when we're talking about thermal losses, so I underestimate it. Actually, uh, one of the disadvantages in this system is thermosis. We have high temperature, I will try to summarize things quickly. Uh, we have high temperature, as I mentioned, operates at 800 degrees, and there are a large amount of heat transfer or heat loss. And once we lose heat, the efficiency of the system decreases. So we try this system to minimize the amount of heat transfer or thermosis. Or to collect or to choose to select the most appropriate system with minimum heat loss. Of course, the most important uh, source of radiation of heat loss is radiation because uh, radiation is rather significant at high temperature, at e to the 4, as we all know. So, radiation the most uh, 
Uh, we are using cavity, as I mentioned, to minimize the amount of heat loss. This is an uh, advantage. Uh, we try to use an uh, absorber, uh, the surface that the receiver with high absorptivity, so we apply, uh, we call it uh, selective surfaces. The selective surface should be characterized by two things, absorbs uh, almost all the solar radiation, in the visible or ultraviolet, and then minimizes heat uh, loss or emitted in the infrared region. Uh, now this is the, the heat engine, actually the uh, heat engine, what it's doing, has a work operating on a certain cycle, a certain cycle of, has a fluid, so as I just mentioned, the heat will be transferred to the working fluid from the high source, which is the sodium fused sodium. Uh, the cycles could be sterling, Rankine cycle or uh, other Brighton cycle. Uh, when we talk about the efficiency, unfortunately, it's not that high, but we have different factors that uh, determine the efficiency. Most important, solar radiation, radiation concentration, how much we concentrate energy onto the receiver, uh, intercept factor, uh, thermal efficiency, uh, receiver, sorry, thermal receiver efficiency, engine efficiency, generator efficiency. Uh, this is how the uh, power increases with the dielectric normal radiation. As uh, we can see, within the 900 uh, watt per meter square, it's almost linear, the power output with the direct normal intensity. Uh, as the power input or the incident increases, uh, it has a maximum efficiency and almost flattened because of the heat losses. So, the heat losses. Uh, really uh, stops the efficiency from increasing uh, interceptive factor. Interceptive factor is the ratio of the radiation that hits the receiver compared to the radiation that is reflected. Also, this is based in the efficiency. Uh, it depends on several factors like geometric and uh, mirror quality. This is the most important factor and tracking pendulum force. And the thermal efficiency of the receiver, as explained above, especially radiated and competitive heat losses affect the receiver efficiency. That's why we want to maintain that this is the closest minimum possible. Uh, heat engine efficiency, uh, geometrical efficiency, generator efficiency is almost 90 percent. Uh, established technology and the high efficiency that is reached uh, do not leave much space for improvement. Uh, parasitic Efficiency, energy storage system efficiency also depends on uh, the own power consumption. For, for example, we need some uh, power to track the sun tracking mechanism. Uh, this figure represents the <coughs> five minutes. Okay, this is one before that. Uh, as we can see, the, the efficiency loss in each component uh, the diagram shows this is also the solar energy of the diagram shows the water charge is showing the successive production of the solar energy uh, into the final energy usage. As we can see uh, the maximum is reflected. And uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Hamdan, for the interesting presentation about this tiling system. Uh, we have actually some more minutes for your questions. In case you have, if not, uh, we could proceed with the next presentation. So, please, uh, is there any questions? Yeah. Okay, the cost actually depends on many things. Region, uh, most important, where you are, uh, how much uh, power you want to produce, and so on. But of course, as a renewable energy uh, investment, uh, most important uh, disadvantage is the initial high cost. I don't have an exact figure, but uh, I'm sure it is rather 
more expensive than the national price nowadays. But uh, you know, in this subject, actually, we are working more in the future. Especially, if we have an example here in Jordan. As you know, the rate of uh, electricity cost rate increased almost double for the high consumption region. So uh, that means we have really to start thinking and working on alternative sources of energy. Okay, we could take one more question, Firat. Yeah, this is of course the cost of manufacturing is less for sure, like Fresnel. So, uh, but unfortunately, it will, you know, we have to optimize or sacrifice the efficiency. The highest efficiency to have a continuous, nice uh, mirror, but of course, as the cost increases, we have to sacrifice the efficiency. Yes, you are right. Okay, thank you very much once again, Professor Hamdan for the presentation and before proceed, uh, we pr proceed with the next uh, presentation uh, I have to say that I, I can see new faces and for those of them who are curious about what happened yesterday and what uh, would happen tomorrow there is um, a summary of abstracts printed uh, at the University of Jordan uh, and uh, I cannot see it here so this could be also, I think, I don't know, uh, arranged for you. Uh, so it's uh, um, um, a small hint for, for, for you. And now um, uh, I would like to give the floor to Professor Salman Ajib uh, from the Hochschule uh, Ostwestfalen-Lübel. It's a German university of uh, applied sciences. Professor Salman uh, is a professor there. Uh, his research interests are solar cooling, heat pumps, uh, renewable energies. Uh, he has more than 67 publications in this, in this field, plus six patents. Uh, his experience is widespread in the fields of solar thermal cooling, air conditioning, geothermal energy, decentral energy supplying. Professor Salman Ajib will, 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 will be presenting uh, uh, to us a presentation about combination of solar energy and heat pumps for heating and cooling of buildings. So, Professor Salman Ajib, you have the ground for the next 30 minutes. Thank you very much. Good okay. morning, everybody. I welcome you to my presentation. Solar uh, combination of solar energy and heat pumps for heating and cooling <laughs> of uh, buildings. Uh, this presentation is uh, this uh, work uh, has been done at the Eminem uh, University of Arts at the Eminem University of Technology with my colleagues, Professor uh, Kadmo and Sadi. And uh, we, uh, I, I will present uh, the main uh, results, uh, actual research results at this field. Uh, firstly, uh, I will give a uh, short uh, introduction about the study systems. Then uh, I will present the study systems, some of the study systems, some simulation results, economical, energetical, and ecological comparison of the study systems will be uh, all illustrated. And uh, finally, a uh, small conclu conclusion. Why we uh, Yes, uh, as you know, uh, one uh, needs uh, a very uh, amount for, uh, especially in Europe or in uh, Germany, one amount of energy for heating and uh, for heating, especially for heating and for hot water preparing. Also, uh, one needs a huge amount for cooling in the uh, south, uh, south countries, as the Jordanian, uh, Syrian, Arab countries, uh, also in. Uh, Many countries. Uh, in Jordania, the part is a uh, uh, part of uh, heating or uh, the part of energy which is uh, needed uh, for uh, household is about 31% from uh, any uh, consumption energy. 
from this uh, 31% is uh, 77 only for heating and hot water, uh, hot water uh, preparing. And this uh, hot water and uh, water preparing and uh, uh, heating for heating, that of course uh, consumption uh, uh, made a okay, huge uh, amount of energy uh, for uh, of consumption of energy uh, for this aim. Uh, in conventional, uh, <coughs> in conventional uh, time or, the, or manner, the, uh, this is uh, oil, gas, or uh, coal. Uh, the better possibility is, of course, uh, using of solar energy or uh, heat pumps. Therefore, we uh, studied this, uh, the possibility of uh, using of this system, and uh, as solar system alone, or as heat pump, or in combination with one another, and we made them, uh, then the uh, comparison with uh, ge uh, energetical, economical, and ecologi uh, ecological uh, comparison between these systems. The study system is uh, a simple system. Yes, uh, that is our uh, system here. That is the uh, uh, floor and floor where we uh, want to uh, make heating in the, the system. And uh, we have the boiler here. We, uh, that is normal. And that, the first system is typical heating system with gas or boiler, hot water tank, heating exchanger, or low temperature circuit, without solar plant, this man, and with a copper storage tank for heating. The second system is with solar system, as you see here, with buffer tank and a conventional uh, boiler with uh, gas or oil. And this, uh, the solar energy can be stored here in the buffer and can be, uh, we can take, in this case, uh, when the solar energy is not enough, for heating, we can uh, support it with uh, this uh, point. The third system is heating system with solar thermal plant and higher heat pump as separate system. We uh, aim the heat pump here as higher heat pump, that means the uh, heat source is uh, higher, ambient higher, and uh, that will be uh, made the efficiency of the system better as we uh, see now. It is possible to use of excessive solar thermal energy because the uh, low storage accuracy. Here we uh, let the storage uh, time, uh, so we uh, could uh, uh, decrease the cost, the cost of the system. The other, the other system, more uh, system, optimal heating system with solar thermal plant, heat pump and storage of solar thermal energy. The solar energy can be stored here in this uh, tank here. This, so we can take two times, I suppose. And here uh, we have the uh, heat source from the earth ground uh, the, uh, heat source and here is our uh, heat pump and the system can be uh, uh, supplied with heat, uh, hot water and uh, for heating and for, for domestic use here. Uh, here we uh, started uh, uh, we drive the heat pump with the photovoltaic system. And this is the Optimized system, we have a storage of excess solar uh, energy, and according to operating condition, the solar energy can be used for the water heating or directly as a heat source for the heat pump. <coughs> of course, we uh, have to, uh, to calculate uh, the uh, energy demand for heating and uh, hot water uh, preparing for the whole system, we made that uh, according to the uh, German uh, norms, uh, the 
and uh, weekly, uh, more quickly, the uh, temperature will be transferring from the uh, supply pipe to the uh, distance or to the earth uh, and uh, far away from the supply pipe. Okay, we have also studied the influence of the design of uh, the collector on the temperature provided in the air. Uh, we have uh, capillar uh, done for double four uh, pipes or coaxial sounding. Uh, uh, and uh, you see, uh, actually, depending on the uh, thermal conductivity of these materials, the, uh, the spreading of the temperature or the energy from the supply pipe to the uh, distance to the earth will be uh, better. That, of course, uh, more uh, simulation results uh, have been done, and uh, I, I will uh, let say uh, get uh, in, uh, in this presentation. But uh, we, uh, I will uh, show you the results of uh, economical, energetical, and ecological comparison between uh, nine uh, studied systems. The systems are uh, that means the heating and, or the energy for heating and hot water uh, supply was assumed through the uh, mentioned nine system. The one system is natural gas <coughs> condensing boiler. The uh, second system, natural gas condensing boiler with solar thermal water heating and heating support. Third uh, system, fuel oil condensing boiler. The first system, fuel oil condensing boiler with solar thermal water heating and heating support. Uh, wood pellet boiler, wood pellet with solar thermal water heating and uh, heating support. Uh, fried water heat pump, fried water heat pump with solar thermal heating and uh, heating support. Air water heat pump and the last one, air water heat pump with solar thermal water heating and heating support. For these systems, we assume, of course, the, uh, the same uh, working conditions. That means the, the same energy demand and the uh, same uh, ambient temperature, outer ambient temperature, higher temperature. And uh, the same uh, heating system, the floor system. Yes, I'm under, sorry. It, is, it seems that uh, some mistake is not to take that. Uh, uh, some uh, thoughts are, uh, are uh, released. Sorry. Uh, okay. Uh, and as conclusion, as, or, or, or as a result, we studied the systems, uh, the nine systems. We uh, have uh, we, uh, the result. We uh, have uh, noted that the system with uh, air with uh, heat pump and uh, and, uh, and solar thermal uh, system with 50% uh, 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 share of uh, solar uh, uh, energy is a better system from uh, ecological and uh, economical uh, point of view. Which system? Uh, system number one. Please, uh, uh, unfortunately, I, I, I have in my stick. That means we can uh, we can uh, recommend that man uh, that, that one uh, takes the system with heat pumps and uh, actually for the importance of heat pumps one sees that that the uh, that the uh, installed heat pumps in Germany uh, has uh, about uh, two or three quarter uh, as I said uh, more as uh, the number of the historic heat pumps in 2005 to uh, 2010 about uh, two uh, double, uh, double as uh, double times. As conclusion, sorry for another word. As the combination between solar thermal systems and heat pump systems for heating and cooling of buildings is a good opportunity to enhance the uh, energy 
efficiency of building by the combination of solar thermal energy and heat pump, one can achieve an attractive heating and cooling system, and it has a lot of advantages. Some of these are the solar thermal shade can cover about more than 50 percent of the total heating demand. The heat pump works at a higher coefficient of performance for the three. Use of solar yield at low temperature thermal energy source if it is isn't directly used for the water for uh, heating or heating uh, hot water. The stagnation of the solar thermal plants is avoided in uh, summer by the storage of excessive heat and the stored energy can serve uh, later the heat pump as uh, an additional heat source. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Rajiv, for the nice presentation. Thank you very Actually, much. Actually, it's a very important topic for you. What's the type of solar collectors you used for the cooling and heating system, especially in cooling system? Yeah. Uh, and what's the temperature, uh, yes. temperature out, out with temperature from the uh, solar collectors? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, the uh, type of uh, solar collector, what we and uh, therefore uh, we have uh, we have been uh, open uh, dimension the solar collector because we support the solar system with heat pump. Of course, the, the system in, in this case is more expensive, uh, but we uh, could in this uh, case actually uh, supply all uh, the heating uh, demand and the heating, uh, heating energy that, uh, we, we, we could cover all the heating demand and energy uh, for heating and hot water and for cooling we could uh, take the uh, water or the, um, the energy from the airs in uh, summer and uh, cool the, uh, and supply the uh, floor uh, pipes with uh, Cool, uh, with cold water from the air, from the uh, air, and uh, in this case we put uh, cooling our hearts. Uh, what's the temperature? Uh, 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 for, for cooling or for heating? From the solar collector. About cool. Uh, uh, for, for, from solar collector, about 70 degrees. 70? 70, yes. 70 degrees. 90, 90 maximum. The, the maximum. the maximum actually was 90 degrees centigrade. <laughs> yes. yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. 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 Really have yeah. so, so, uh, can you get back to the uh, 10 options, uh, please, uh, the slide? Uh, no, no, the one after. The no. 10 options. The, the ten, yeah, yeah, 10 systems. Uh, yes. Which one you mentioned was the best uh, choice or the best? Uh, yes, the, the best uh, choice one was the system here with AIR. Air heat pump with uh, solar thermal uh, water heating and uh, heating because from the uh, economical point of view that was a bit the better system because uh, in this case we could uh, actually uh, supply with uh, the whole uh, energy uh, for heating and for hot water and uh, yes uh, but for cooling of course. The, uh, that means for cooling, heating, and uh, and hot water preparing was the rain system here, rain water uh, heat pump with solar thermal water heating, and because in this case we could also make cooling for the uh, system. Uh, actually, our company we uh, supply uh, air to water heat pumps, and yes. we use it for heating and cooling, and we combine hot water with the. Uh, the solar uh, system with the double coil, uh, yes. 
this very successful uh, yes, uh, system. I think. And for Jordan, it is not needed to go for the ground water heat pump because the temperature does not go below minus two during winter. So the efficiency for air to water heat pumps will be still uh, high efficiency even uh, at minus two, minus five. While maybe in Germany it goes to minus 15 or minus 20, maybe you would go for ground to water heat pumps. Yeah, as for uh, Germany, the condition actually this system, the both system, I do uh, prime water heat pump and air water uh, heat pump to solar uh, system. What's that? Okay, so we we'll take one more question. Uh, is there any more question? So, okay, uh, many thanks, Professor Ajib, once again for the nice presentation. And um, I'll give now the floor to my colleague, Mr. Piros, Alex Polos, um, from the uh, Aachen um, University of Applied Sciences. Uh, Piros is a physicist, uh, he has got his PhD. Uh, from the German Aerospace Center, where actually where I'm working as well now, in the field of solar thermal uh, power plant. He, he's working since 2005 um, at the Solar Institute of uh, Jülich, um, and he is leading the, a group in the field of solar chemistry, uh, desalination, and simulation of solar tower, uh, solar, um, um, uh, tower power plants. Uh, Spiros um, uh, has a presentation for us today about the secondary applications and hybridization of solar power, uh, solar tower systems. So, Spiros, you have the ground for the next 30 minutes, please. Thank you, Louis. Yes, uh, the Solar Institute of Zurich is an institution of the University of Applied Science of Aachen, and we are doing research in the field of renewable energy energy saving and also for training. I, I will uh, start with the introduction and uh, will continue with uh, giving you some input about the solar tower of Yuli and especially for this uh, that we are not yesterday here. And uh, then I will continue with the main topic, uh, the hybridization, and then with the second topic, the secondary applications. I will then finish with the conclusion and uh, with a small outline. Um, you know that uh, solar thermal systems, uh, mainly we have uh, four technologies, parabolic graph, solar tower, linear fragment collectors, and parabolic dish. And uh, I will focus on the solar tower, especially on the solar tower power plant of Yuli. This is the first of its kind that uses air as a heat uh, transfer fluid and uh, it's a volumetric uh, type of receiver. It's located in uh, Jülich, Germany. It has a Hillestad field of around 18,000 uh, square meters. It's uh, 60 meters tall, has uh, 1.5 megawatts uh, electrical power and uh, the hot air temperature nominal condition is around uh, 700 degrees and the storage dimension is for around 1 to 1.5 uh, hours. It's uh, owned uh, now by the TLR, by the German Aerospace Center, and scientific research, so research is done uh, with, from the German Aerospace Center together with the Zola Institute of Europe. This power plant uh, was built as a, for technology demonstration reasons, and uh, it has a, at around 30 meters, here at this stage it has a platform for component uh, tests of the different materials and also for solar chemistry. Here some uh, characteristic uh, pictures. Uh, bird view. You can see the helioslide here of the, the tower. Here also from operation. Also at winter and uh, the main system consists of the heliostat field of the receiver and we have a thermal storage, a heat recovery steam generator and then the conventional system. And I go to the principle and uh, we have the heliostat field, we have the ambient air, the ambient air is sucked through the receiver, it's uh, heated up and it can uh, 
it can grow to full uh, thermal storage or directly to a heat recovery steam generator and uh, then produce uh, steam. The air comes with around uh, 700 degrees and the produced steam is expanded in a steam turbine and we have production of electricity by a generator. And uh, we have the, the solar unit here and we have the conventional power plant. The air circulates back from the uh, heat recovery steam generator in order to cool down the volumetric receiver. And uh, such a system can be hybridized as well. What is the main object of the hybridization? To get, in order to rise the operational uh, hours of such a plant, you may whether implement a storage device, this is done here, or you can hybridize the system. And the possibility is with the channel burner, you can locate it between the receiver and the heat recovery steam generator, and additionally, with fuel, for example, natural gas or biogas, you can uh, reach high temperatures and produce uh, steam. Another possibility is to use a gas turbine. A gas turbine can be positioned here, you have additionally production of electricity, of course, but you can also use the exhausted gases from the turbine in order to produce electricity at uh, night or if you have less uh, solar radiation. And um, in our institution, we had uh, we developed a library in order to calculate the whole system and to calculate uh, the hybrid system with the gas turbine or with the burner. And uh, we created a simulation tool that has uh, different features. It can do steady state mode. It has steady state models, but also dynamic models specialized for parts like the storage, like the heat recovery steam generator. And uh, it's applicable, adjustable. It's very easy of, of modification, and we have the uh, high resolution touch steps. And we integrated uh, the steam properties as well as properties of the gas in order to calculate its, uh, its state. Uh, the project uh, we had uh, was called Hipsol. Uh, we had it together with uh, the German Aerospace Center, with the construction firm, and with different pa uh, partners from the University of Athens. And the aim was to develop concepts for solar tower plants with biogas or with natural gas. <laughs> and the aim was, on the one hand, on the power plant of Yulik, but also we discussed uh, other power plants like in Nigeria. And uh, the main task was to create a simulation model for the calculation of hybrid solar tower systems. So, at the solar tower power plant of Yulik, we have the solar only part together with the storage. And the hybridization was only a project where we did uh, different calculations. Uh, some further fields of expertise of the Zola Institute. We have uh, development of uh, demonstration and CSP technology, as I mentioned before, simulation and design of Zola thermal tower plants. We have also development of high temperature thermal storage mm -hmm. using Quadsat together with the German Aerospace Center. And also we are focusing on uh, Zola Chemistry specialized. Uh, we have a project uh, about Zola methanol production. And uh, what happens here is uh, we have a CO2 together with hydrogen, and we have production of uh, methanol and also of water. And uh, by this project, we, the aim was to, have, to make a market analysis and assessment of the different processes for Zola methanol production from CO2. We consider different concepts, and then we focus in, in two concepts. And uh, the task of this project that is uh, now running is inventory thinking, investigation into the solarization of process steps. Also, we, uh, we had some solar tests for methanol production at the German Aerospace Center. And uh, then we had uh, scenario drafting and modeling of the annual and revenue accounting. And uh, we want to make comparison of the different systems and to make a market analysis. Partners in this project, of course, the German Aerospace Center and also Ferrostar from uh, ESI. Another interesting um, application, secondary application, 
is uh, the convention of methane to synthesis uh, gas. So we have methane and the water and together with the sunshine production of C of uh, monoxide and of uh, hydrogen. Such a system with the, the end production of synthesis gas this is uh, the basic uh, for a great variety of chemical products and um, like methanol, like liquid fuels and uh, tensiles. And uh, <coughs> what we want is uh, to, to use uh, sunshine as input and uh, this, is, uh, the, this is energy for an for endothermic reaction which, uh, takes, uh, which is taken from uh, methane and we have a CO2 release. And we have, of course, also methane consumption. And uh, the new uh, focus now is that we want to try to use uh, high temperature solar energy. This is only an idea that uh, we are trying to, together with the German Aerospace Center to, um, to come to such a project. And uh, what, uh, what I mentioned before is uh, the, the one main uh, topic, when we use solar power, we have on the one hand the production of electricity. The other thing is that we use the heat and uh, we can take the heat and uh, use it for chemical reaction. This is uh, done, for example, for methanol production or for synthesis gas. And here then we get different fuels like uh, hydrogen or CO and hydrogen. And uh, we have the converter, we have the fuel cells, and then we can use them for, uh, as an energy carrier or also directly for transportation and also for electricity generation as well. And uh, to do some uh, principle uh, solar fuel production, there are different uh, necessities. For example, we need a solar furnace. Here, an example from Cologne, from the German Aerospace Center. We can use a heliostat and uh, with a concentrator and uh, with experiments in a small scale, we can do solar service dry experiments. Here, you can see a reactor, and from the heliostat, we go to the concentrator, and from there, we have a concentrated solar radiation into the solar furnace. And here you can position your reactor device where uh, different uh, experiments can be done. The other thing is to use uh, a larger scale, like I said before, the research platform at the Zola Tower, uh, power plant in Julius. And uh, this is also a field from the platform here around uh, down to the Heliostat field. And uh, you can select the uh, some part of the heliostat field and use this radiation in order to do experimental research. The different uh, further secondary applications, we have the steam reforming, uh, and uh, this can be done in uh, three different steps, in three different ways, let's say, whether separated, here you have the heliostat field, and you have the receiver, and you have the heat exchanger, and the reformer, and you have the, the production of the gas. You have the separation, and the, this uh, reformer is ex externally heated by around 700 to 850 degrees. Also, heat storage operation is uh, possible by such a uh, system. Another possibility is the uh, indirect. Here you can uh, have the reformer wall that is irradiated. And uh, then you have uh, directly a production inside of the, of the gas again. And uh, you have approximately 70% seven, seven of uh, efficiency. The last uh, system is an integrated direct and volumetric system. Here you have the, the reactor inside. And uh, you can uh, have uh, a direct production. And uh, you can reach also high efficiencies and uh, very high uh, flux densities of uh, solar radiation. Also, some further secondary applications. Uh, this is an old project uh, from, the, from the German Aerospace Center, the so-called Zolki Cup. Here, uh, this is um, using methane and uh, concentrated solar radiation, and we have uh, the solar, the solar crack reactor at very high temperatures, and then you can crack uh, 
Let me take it down to C and the uh, hydrogen, and then you can get the hydrogen and use it also as a fuel. This is a project uh, that finished in uh, 2010. Another possibility is uh, the hydrogen production, uh, thermochemical hydrogen production. And here we have uh, also the use of chemistats directly in uh, two reactors. When in the first uh, reactor we have the first step, where we do from water, a uh, water splitting, you get hydrogen at high temperatures of uh, around 800 degrees. And in the second reactor, then we have the uh, regeneration and the uh, reproduction of O2 at also high temperatures of around 1,100 degrees to 1,200 uh, 1, degrees. And uh, such a system uses water splitting in several successive steps. And the main advantages here are that you can have temperatures low than uh, 2,000 degrees. And uh, you have no separation uh, of O2 and hydrogen. And you have an inter intermediate state of conversion from thermal energy also to electricity. This is also possible. And you can get high efficiencies compared to electrolysis. If you compare electrolysis to such a system. And uh, now I come also to a, de to a, a totally different uh, application of uh, solar power power plants. And uh, additionally now to solar chemistry, you can also uh, do a desalination. And uh, there are three different ways for that. We have here the solar field, so let's say the heliostat field, and uh, the whole reactor, the solar tower. And uh, we have then also together with the storage device. And uh, you use here only the heat. So the heat you can use uh, MED and use effective uh, distillation. And uh, maybe you need additional fuel and electricity from the grid. And uh, then you can do desalination and you get uh, drinkable water. Another possibility is uh, with uh, reverse osmosis that you use from the solar fields the production of electricity in order to feed the pumps of the reverse osmosis plant. And then you have the production of uh, water uh, and you can use uh, the water as uh, drinkable or for agriculture as well. And uh, another possibility is the combination. So you have the solar field, you have the storage and uh, the, the conventional plant. <coughs> and all together you can use, uh, you can combine it also with the hydrogen system. And uh, you can use the heat directly to the <coughs> MED. And also you can use electricity in order to supply the MED if necessary. And then you get the drinkable water. And especially, especially for lands um, in the MENA region where also water shortage problems are very important, then such a combination uh, can be a solution. If we see now the, the scene again of the Zola only plant at, um, at Ulysses, then there are different possibilities. And uh, first of all, okay, you have production of electricity, and directly you can use this electricity for a reverse osmosis pl uh, plant and produce water. Another possibility is to use uh, the heat from the condensator of the conventional system and then uh, to add uh, MED and produce also uh, drinkable water. And there are uh, also different uh, systems that can be applied in here. Okay, so I come to the conclusion. Uh, first of all, I presented to you the Zolato power plant of Julius, owned by the German Aerospace Center, and it's the worldwide first one, the first solar power system that uses air as a heat uh, transfer fluid. I showed you some uh, different ways of utilization of uh, such a solar power system, whether with uh, gas, whether with natural gas or also with biogas. <coughs> And uh, you can combine it with a gas burner or even better with a gas turbine and get a cogeneration system. Then I showed you different secondary applications of the solar tower, especially for solar chemistry. We saw the methanol production, solar methanol production, 
and uh, also hydrogen produ production and further secondary applications. And then we saw the desalination and the possibilities to combine the solar tower with desalination devices. So in future, a lot of activities, of uh, research activities will be also done in this uh, field. Of course, uh, such projects are financed uh, by Germany, by different ministries, with the Ministry of, uh, Foreign Af of Economic Affairs of the State of Westphalia, uh, uh, German Environmental Ministry, the Federal uh, Ministry, and uh, also the Zola Tower itself was financed by uh, the State of Bavaria and, uh, from, and the different projects also from the, university, from the Ministry of Education and uh, Research. Thank you for your attention. Dr. Spiros Alexopoulos, thank you very much for the interesting uh, presentation, which is actually a continuation of what we have started yesterday. There were actually three other presentations on solar tower uh, yesterday, introduction and so on, so it's a continuation. Um, um, I, we will take um, a few questions if you have uh, before getting the, and, uh, having the next presentation. And um, uh, First question goes to Mata. Uh, I was to decide what to be like. And you see that if you uh, can speak loud, okay. you will be removed and get a side of what to be like, a lot of solutions. And you see that uh, to leave a side of what to be like, you will to do this uh, temperature of fluid. And uh, from that, you need to move on, use it for water acceleration. Yes, after the bank. Yes. So, what is the, for one thing about uh, like your uh, solar tower, what is the uh, volume of the or the quality of water that you can submit using this system? Oh, I, I can, it depends on the layout and of the design and also on the demand. Now, for purity of course, it, uh, we, we will try to, to make such a project we have the beginning now, but uh, I cannot go. Detail on that now, it depends on the design conditions. But we want to, to check such a system only with the small parts, not only with the total MED. Okay, so take uh, next question or another question. Here, please. Thank you, I have one question. Uh, why do you want to crack Nepal uh, into hydrogen and uh, carbon? What is the advantage or implication of this? As I know, in World War II, they uh, tried the other way around in that field. Why do we want to crack a good storm uh, energy carrier into a, a difficult handle with hydrogen and carbon in the other parts? Yes, there, there are different possibilities. If you get fuel, then you can uh, have it as a, also for transportation, but also you can use it for electricity production as well. So it depends uh, which way is the easiest. Because when you do this, uh, when you use solar chemistry, then you do not need the conventional part. Okay? And you can use also in some uh, areas, it will be interesting. Okay? So it's another approach. And uh, for hydrogen production directly, of course, you have uh, different possibilities, but this is on a research step. Okay? In my opinion, it's easier to use the uh, time directly as uh, energy. Yes, this was just a project. Okay, so it was uh, only for research. Interesting is directly to use water and to crack it, yes. thermochemical. Yes. And the other possibility is, uh, is to about solar methanol production. But you directly use CO2 and water and then have uh, methanol production. These are some uh, directly chemical pro uh, compound production. Okay, so uh, the next question, Mark. Thank you. So maybe to add um, one comment to the for why we would use um, out of um, methanol, we would use um, other gases. The idea behind is that we can um, get solar energy. Uh, we can upgrade the methanol to CO and. Um, 
So that's the idea is, if you um, look at the <coughs> energy content of either hydrogen, uh, uh, methanol, no, methane, or hydrogen and CO, it is an upgrade. So you could have a solar plant upgrading your methane, methane and then at night burn this um, gas, this upgraded gas, and so we can store this solar energy. That is one application of this building uh, reaction. Okay, thank you for work. Um, uh, is there any uh, more question? Um, or, uh, okay. Okay, thank you very much once again, uh, Spiro. And now we proceed with the last presentation in this session with uh, my colleague, uh, Marcus Eck, Dr. Marcus Eck uh, from the German Aerospace Center. He's uh, a technical uh, physicist uh, and um, a mechanical engineer. And, uh, he worked in the field, or he's working in the field of parabolic traffic. Um, uh, solar thermal power plants for more than 15 years and he is now heading the area of thermal energy storage development at the German Aerospace Center uh, in Stuttgart. So, um, uh, Markus um, uh, will present, will have a presentation for us about thermal energy storage systems uh, for solar thermal power plants and uh, he will tell us about uh, the present status and current development in this field. Uh, so, uh, Marcus, you have the graph for the next uh, 30 minutes, please. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I think I'll take the mic because I'm a little bit too tall for this consolation. So, uh, I'm sorry for being the last hurdle between you and the coffee break, so I'll do my best to speed up a little bit and to keep the hurdle as low as possible. So, as Louis already mentioned, I will give a lecture on, or give a talk on the present situation of, of thermal energy technology for CSP plants and especially the current developments that we are doing at ELR. So, the, <coughs> the content of the talk will be, first of all, of sure, an introduction. What is thermal energy storage? What is the idea behind the present status of the different technologies that we have in our mind and the current development that we are now proceeding at ELR and finally, of course, the conclusion. So, why do we need thermal energy uh, storage in solar thermal power plants? For example, if you here see a block <coughs> with a typical pattern, so it's very important. And finally, extent of consortium formation. Normally, it's not one company, a single company, who will do all of this project. Uh, there, there are many companies uh, each one has um, <coughs> a specific function and they complement each other in this case. And um, as a utility or a project company, not a project com um, uh, developer in this case, a government, you have to examine uh, how these companies fit together. Very simple. So uh, the, next, um, uh, the next step in, uh, now is to uh, prepare the request for proposal. Um, uh, which is um, issuing the tender documents uh, in principle. And uh, these include uh, the following steps um, uh, that the bidders need to know um, uh, general instructions about uh, the whole um, uh, project. They, uh, the, there should be general technical specification taken from the feasibility study or um, uh, conceptual um, uh, uh, design and ex um, uh, expanded here and um, to tell the, 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 the bidders more technically about what should be they should know that, uh, about that. So it's, it's different of course the extent of information between uh, APC model or IPP model as I mentioned previously. Uh, fin finally um, you have to um, um, issue uh, the bid forms. Uh, normally um, standard bid forms are used for that purpose. Um, in order to initiate a fair um, uh, application process, so all bidders have to fill the same uh, forms at the end. Uh, finally, you have to prepare drawings and diagrams. You don't have to do all of this stuff by your own self. There, there, there are consultants um, who are doing this for you, by the way. Um, uh, and to prepare the draft agreements. Most important for the bidders to know 
uh, how does your PAA power purchase agreement looks like? Um, it's a draft, it's not final, but they have to know about the local conditions and how much money will they get at the end of the day. Um, uh, the, um, uh, the next step would be uh, to uh, negotiate your contract uh, through how much? So um, uh, the contract negotiation is very important at this stage because um, uh, now things get more concrete. So you are getting through uh, the shortlisting of two or maximum of three bidders will be uh, prepared um, after um, uh, applying the application. Um, uh, after that step, you, you will negotiate with the winner, the, with the first winner. And the further negotiation with the second or third uh, will be done only if your negotiation uh, with the first uh, bidder uh, are not successful. Uh, negotiation now uh, in the term of, um, of course, financial aspect, the power purchase agreement, the APC agreement, operation and maintenance agreement. So we are talking money. Um, uh, then, um, uh, um, uh, Okay, the clarification is not very important. Finalization of power purchase agreement, the PPA is done, performed uh, after this stage, uh, after the negotiation. Uh, finalization of other contracts, as I mentioned, back to back negotiation of these three contracts, O and M, and M uh, contract, uh, APC contract, and PPA contract are done back to back. And then you sign the contract and you register the project company, which is now officially uh, existing and will start the work. And consists, if you remember, of 50-60% uh, of the government and 40% of developers. So the developers go in the IPP uh, scheme. Uh, this is the um, uh, schedule, uh, which I have already now uh, shown. Um, you can see the um, uh, pre-qualification, preparation of uh, request for proposal, and then um, tender phase, um, uh, submission and opening of proposal phase, evaluation and um, um, selection of best track, uh, bidders, uh, detailed um, uh, clarification and evaluation, I mentioned all these aspects, and finally preparation of PPP contract, PPA contract, and um, uh, then finally the financial closure, which is the stage in which everything is fixed. So the PPA is fixed for the next 15 to 20 years. The APC contract um, is fixed and the operation maintenance uh, is fixed. The third phase, um, I don't have much time, and that's why I will um, uh, make that as fast as possible, uh, includes uh, uh, construction on site after you have prepared the ground, the legal financial uh, ground for the construction. So it's about um, starting the construction. So, um, 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 basic. Um, before I go through the steps, it's um, a typical plan of execution uh, of the project. You see here that there are about um, 30 months required uh, to um, finalize such project and um, uh, to start um, operation. And, uh, basic engineering uh, is the first step in this regard, and here we are talking about preparation of part of specification based on technical specification. Uh, we need for that five, six months, and uh, the scope of work is um, uh, very large. I will jump uh, from that to, because the name tells you actually about basic engineering, the detailed engineering, and here we are preparing um, uh, the ready for construction plan. So, uh, including every body, every, um, uh, every, 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 single piece actually to be installed there or done there. Um, six to nine months um, typically is required to uh, finish this detailed engineering. Um, um, and then um, we have to buy the equipment required, for example, the uh, steam uh, turbine, um, uh, 
the, 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 the storage and uh, components, all of the required equipment actually. Um, and then and, uh, the, and start the construction phases, starting of course with site preparation, for example, leveling of the CSP site, um, the moving to the civil works, for example, uh, construction of roads, and then, uh, then um, uh, building the collector assembly factory. So there will be a factory built on site, actually, a small factory to construct your um, uh, parabolic drop collector in this day, uh, to be ready for installation, and then finally, finally uh, mechanical completion. Here you can see some pictures um, uh, on the site preparation, so we're making the delivery. And then, um, and here you can see that um, uh, civil works are started, uh, so the, 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 the basis for the collectors and the roads and some buildings are erected. We can see the, a scheme of um, the collector assembly uh, facility on site where you will, it's normally done like that because it's easier to make the assembly on site for the collectors and then take a few meters for the uh, uh, installation then to build it somewhere else uh, because of transportation problem. Um, and here um, we're talking about installation of the equipment including, you um, can see um, uh, on the left, um, uh, the, the power island here and then the, the steam turbine and so on. Um, all of the stuff actually. So um, the, the, the final phase in this regard is the commissioning. Commissioning needs to start working. I will jump from that uh, because this uh, is a complicated process including many um, uh, test uh, certificates to be uh, uh, done because the DPC uh, or the utility or the project company uh, has to make sure that the power plant has been uh, constructed in a proper way and is working in a proper way. So there is also a warranty period of two years to show that everything is um, um, uh, working properly and um, I would jump from the integration maintenance phase because it's business as usual for every uh, uh, power plant. I'm sorry for a um, uh, long uh, presentation. <laughs> but. Um, as I mentioned, uh, there, there, there are a lot of information that I, would, uh, I wanted to deliver to you about, uh, to give you the whole entire picture on uh, how to read CSP for that. Thank you very much. First question. Yeah, sorry. In EBC model, uh, you said that it is uh, actually it's better to have the design <coughs> of the system before to do the bed. Right? What we can see the about. Now, the question is especially in CSP or renewable energy system. We know that when you are saying, uh, I need a 40 megawatt power plant, you know, conventional power plant, it is 40 megawatt power plant. Now, in, in CSP technology, because it depends in, on the solar and or, 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 or you know, some environmental conditions which are uncontrollable. Now, how do you define that the design uh, is, uh, or actually the construction delivered the design, and the design delivered the output of the power plant? Thank you very much for that question. Uh, by the way, this question is uh, not uh, included, it doesn't belong to what I uh, have presented. But I can give you an answer for that. Uh, and um, a criteria that, um, uh, um, one criteria could be considered to define uh, your capacity is the uh, turbine uh, used. Uh, the capacity of the turbine, for example. And of course, you need to know um, that it's, it's, it's not um, uh, a, a plug-in system. There is 
and there are many constraints that tell you or many design topics that tell you how much this um, the power plant will de deliver to you. Uh, based on the local uh, solar resources, you could calculate in principle uh, and, uh, um, the size of the solar field and your storage system, your combination with the solar field, including of course your solar multiples uh, to be included in either one or two uh, SM solar multiple to enable you to deliver the required uh, uh, amount of electricity. Um, so it's based on the design of the solar field, your turbine, steam turbine, on uh, now um, uh, the, 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 the thermal storage system and so on. But I can tell you now, it's that um, uh, No, it's, it's, the system will, the, uh, it's, it's, it's a good point actually. That's why there is a warranty period after commissioning. Because, you know, in, uh, through a period of two years, you prepare your studies. So you start with the site selection study and then pre feasibility or feasibility study, and you make your conceptual design. You, your study is based on reliable. Uh, with our data for that site, that's why we put a um, uh, focus at the DLR and uh, supporting the, our uh, now in the framework of the Lamina project to um, um, deliver or to enable the partners to deliver such a reliable uh, DNI, the direct normal radiation data. At the end, you, your calculations, your study must define your output so, and your engineering should be. Um, go hand in hand with your studies at the end and the company who is constructing the, 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 the project according to the previously made uh, studies uh, should operate at the power plant under a warranty for two years. So the owner will see uh -huh, is that correct or not? They, they will of course uh, uh, identity and so on uh, included, but the um, uh, technical specifications, the design um, define your out, normally defines your out. And in the MENA region, experience is made, uh, the, the, the output is much better or better at least that, as, um, than what already has been uh, designed, because the designer um, uh, tries to stay in safety uh, area for, for later work. I can't tell uh, that. I hope you can answer the question. Okay, thanks. My second question? Yes? Uh, thank you for your presentation. Really, it is a valuable presentation. Now, uh, as all of us know that Gordon is important most of uh, his energy need and is looking for renewable energy. Uh, now you know that solar as renewable energy is under development uh, by both economical and uh, efficiency ones. And now we started on solar energy in, uh, as an IP project. In so, from your experience, from your practical point of view, we need your advice of how we can proceed with IP projects <laughs> pairs for a long run. Because now, maybe we have a revised tariff for the, the energy output, okay? But after maybe two years, three years, the capital cost may be dropped, and also the options will go up. So the philosophy that we have to, to follow with the IBB developers. Can you advise in this regard? Okay. Um, um, uh, in, in the last few weeks, I got to know that uh, in Jordan, the IBB concept is um, uh, it's very, very uh, quite implemented, so um, 
uh, the last um, uh, IPP uh, big or uh, large scale project is the IPP3, um, uh, in which um, uh, I guess Hitachi or another uh, Japanese company has won the, 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 the tender to generate electricity for I guess 18 uh, cents or, or dinar cent per kilowatt hour. Um, uh, it's a conventional uh, power plant, not a CSP power plant. So, um, uh, your question has many parts actually. The IPP um, uh, concept um, um, should be designed in such a way to make your safety as a private investor. On the long run, it's very important for you uh, to have a guarantee to be paid through power purchase agreement. Uh, doesn't have to be uh, a feed-in tariff. Uh, feed-in tariff for CSP is not uh, very typical actually, but uh, power purchase agreement will give you the guarantee for the next 15 to 20 years to uh, pay back your investment. Because you'll invest now, you will calculate uh, your costs on based on today's price, not on tomorrow's price, uh, and you need to get your money back um, uh, based on these calculations from today. Okay, if the price sinks tomorrow, or in two or three years, the other IPP company, which will build uh, or construct um, a new IPP or power plant, whatever it is, uh, um, will calculate on the recent price, and based on this, we get its uh, power purchase agreement with the government. So the government, uh, it's not fooling around the utility, they know uh, actually what costs, and we can take uh, an example um, uh, development of feed-in tariffs in, in Europe, and especially in Germany. So we have started uh, uh, some 10 years ago with 50 cents per uh, generated kilowatt hour, and now ended uh, with below 20, 20 um, uh, euro cents for kilowatt hour. So if you build now, you will be paid better. Today's calculation and even more. Uh, it's another story, so it's um, the, the trade off uh, which you have to decide if you want to build now and uh, contribute to the learning curve for the, the development of this technology here in Jordan now, or to wait until others uh, do this and then uh, um, uh, do it uh, an easier way later. So it's your decision, but there is no master plan to make more savings for you. Let me say mediocre solar day with high fluctuation. If you do not have a energy storage, may it be in PV or may it be in CSP plant, you will have a similar output as you have an in input. So that means you have the same pattern, and therefore you will need an additional backup system in your in your power pump itself or in the grid. And so you can install also an energy storage capacity that allows you to produce electricity on demand, which would mean that you can follow in principle every load pattern that you want. So, and another idea behind is that you, especially in CSP plants, you can reduce the costs, the uh, levelized cost of electricity by introducing a thermal energy storage technology. In other technologies, it will add up some costs to your LECs in solar solar power plant. In specific cases, it might also decrease the costs of the whole system. <clears throat> but one problem with thermal energy technologies in solar solar power plants is that you do not have one only single solar solar power plant, but you have uh, plenty of technical projects. You have different heat filter fluids, might, might it be synthetic oil, saturated steam, superheated steam, more salt, or air, might it be uh, compressed, or ambient, uh, an ambient pressure. You have different collector systems like trucks or panels, towers, and maybe also new uh, uh, additional innovative concepts in the future. You have different uh, pressure, operation pressures between ambient pressure and up to more than 100 bar in steam cycles. We have different temperature ranges for starting from 260 degrees, maybe in CSP plants, up to uh, roughly 1000 degrees C. And this is a collector size, the solar side. And on the other side, you have different heat engines. You have organic rapid cycles, steam turbines, gas turbines, uh, stirring engines, and maybe others. And, so, and the storage has to combine each 
side uh, with, uh, with each other, so there are plenty of options that uh, thermal energy storage has to fulfill, and therefore we do not have one uh, single unique thermal energy storage technology, but you have different options that have to fulfill the specific needs of the technical systems needs. So, and now I want to classify the thermal energy storage to get more, let me say, afterwards more comprehensive. So, here you see the temperature specific entropy diagram, for example, for water. And uh, on the hot side, for example, if you have a steam cycle, you use the steam for charging the process, and then <coughs> you cool down the superheated steam, condense the red steam, and then afterwards uh, you cool down the water. And if you use this energy for charging your storage, you have the same situation in your storage system. That means you preheat your storage medium, you have a kind of, let me say, evaporation of the storage system, or let me say, the metal heat of the storage system, where you uh, absorb heat at a constant temperature level, and then afterwards you have again a section where you heat up a medium, and during this charging, of course, it's the same uh, situation, vice versa. And this leads to two different types of energy storage systems. That means you have a sensible heat storage, where you store energy by heating up the medium and you have a electric heat storage where you apply it or you use a kind of um, you know, uh, uh, phase change, maybe condensation or maybe melting, where you use the, or where you store, store energy on a constant temperature level. So that means we have sensible heat and we have electric heat for different thermal applications. And we will uh, have different storage medium, and now I want to reduce it to just liquid medium or solid medium uh, <coughs> for sensible heat storage. And in the case of metal heat, we have phase change materials, PCMs, or steam accumulators where we store saturated water. So that means in principle we have four different types of storage that I will comment on in this. So the state of the art that we all know, or most of you will know, is a mount salt, central uh, heat storage, which is used, for example, in the undersalt plants in uh, Spain and in other plants in Spain too. That means we have two tanks, a cold, a cold tank. Cold means in this uh, situation 290 degrees C. It's filled with uh, more salt. It's a mixture of potassium and sodium nitrate, and it has a storage capacity of roughly 10 or 1,000 megawatt hours, which uh, gives you the situation that you can operate your whole plant for seven to eight hours in the full load after sunset. And then, if you have an excess solar energy, we use this excess solar energy for heating up the warm salt to a temperature of up to 380 to 390 degrees C. And this warm salt is then stored in a separate tank. And if you do not have any energy from the solar field, you can use the thermal energy from the storage tank by just pumping back the hot salt back to the cold tank by passing a heat exchanger. The heat exchanger heats up the oil, the oil uh, transfers the heat to the conventional power cycle, and that's the whole story. Quite simple, and it works, and it's huge. As I said, you can operate your plant for nearly eight hours, but this means we have 10 volumes of roughly 14,000 cubic meters, and this is equivalent to the salt inventory of 28,000 tons of this sodium as a nitrate mixture. The same system is also applied to a solar power system. It's a plant in uh, Spain too, it's called Vima Solar. It has a smaller capacity of only uh, 50 megawatt, but the storage size is much higher, so that means you can operate your plant for 15 hours under uh, full load after sunset. That means, in principle, you are in the position to have a 24 hour, seven days operation at full load with a solar application. And Yes, and in principle it's the same situation. The only difference is that you that in this case the power block is completely decoupled from the solar field. That means the, the, the power block is only operated according to the level in the text and not uh, depending on the solar irradiation on the power. This is quite hard. So another for one main drawback of this salt application is that the salt solidifies at a temperature of roughly 230 degrees C, 250 degrees C, and so you are always keeping your temperature beyond this temperature level, which causes some, let me say, uh, thermal losses, and also it's a kind of uh, process technology 
challenge because once <coughs> you have a solid problem in your system, you have a really serious problem. And so one solution might be to use a solid storage medium, and we have used concrete as a solid medium, uh, and this can be used in the same way as we use a tech on salt storage, that means in the yeah, in high or in periods with high solar irradiation, we just pass the oil through this concrete. The concrete is heated up to a temperature of 380, 390 degrees C. And if you do not have any solar radiation, you just switch the flow path and then you uh, feed the cold oil to the concrete and the oil is heated up in the concrete. So that means you do not have any risk of solar solidification. And one uh, interesting point is that uh, this system is really highly modular, you can uh, scale it up to every uh, size that you want. And we have built and uh, demonstrated the range of two uh, four to kilowatt hours and has have operated it <coughs> for more than 10,000 operation hours and we could not experience any degradation of the system. So and uh, this is a schematic diagram of the solar tower in Uli. We have seen it quite often meanwhile. And here you have uh, in this case the operating uh, or transfer fluid is air, ambient air, so that means it's not pressurized, and in this case you need a kind of, let me say, vessel, where you have just uh, storage bricks, which are uh, these uh, uh, storage bricks made of uh, cement or uh, ceramic, and this is, uh, these corpus stones are directly Flow, uh, flow through by the hot air, the hot air transfers the heat to this uh, medium and then afterwards you can just reverse the flow and extract the heat again. The solar power in Munich is equipped with a storage technology, with a storage system with a capacity of roughly 1.5 kilowatt hours and the operation is quite simple, that means you have two flowers in the cold air path and the first floor, or the, in this scheme the second floor, is controlled to maintain a uh, constant operation temperature in the outlet of the receiver and the second blower is controlled according to the load of the system and then these two blowers or the interaction of these two blowers determine the, the flow direction and also the mass flow through the storage system. So another now we are coming to the latter heat storage systems. One of the most easiest is, is to store, for example, compressed water. The system is usually called root storage. And this is applied in the so-called PS10 or PS20 plants in Spain, where you produce saturated steam in the receiver. The saturated steam is used to heat up the steam storage, or it's called steam storage system, but in principle you store saturated water. And, um, that when you release the pressure in the system, you evaporate the, water, the saturated water and, and thus you produce steam and you could uh, use the steam for driving the saturated steam turbine. So here you see an uh, area view of the system and here downstairs you see the pressure tanks and uh, here's a sketch up of these tanks and it's obvious that you need huge pressure vessels that are really pressure tight and these, these are very expensive and so therefore you can use the system only for small capacity. It's a uh, expensive for uh, future sizes and so therefore we do not have any R&D activities in this field of the future. Now we are coming to another latent heat storage, the PCM storage, where, you, where we use a magnetic energy of uh, nitrate salts. Here you see the entropy, the melting entropy and the melting versus the melting temperature for different nitrate, nitrate salts using alkaline methods and you see that you have different salt mixtures for different melting temperatures and thus for different operation temperatures and operation pressures. So, but one problem for all these PCM storage systems is how to get the energy uh, from the fluid to the storage medium because one point is once, once you, uh, the salt solidifies around the tubes you increase the uh, heat transfer, let me say, resistance, and the power goes down. So therefore, the challenge is to increase the heat transfer from the fluid to the, let me say, uh, melted part of your storage. And one way, one easy way, is to use fins, a 
around the observatories to transfer the heat from the fluid to the extent of to the uh, areas far away from the tube. And yeah, this, here you see the, the first approach where we have fitted tubes and therefore we uh, realized or we reached uh, thermal conductivity in the range of beyond 10 watts per uh, meter Kelvin, for example, uh, solidified salt is below 2 uh, watt per meter Kelvin, which is really low for this application. So, meanwhile, we have used four different PCM materials, therapy or achieving four different process temperatures in the range of, let me say, 140 degrees C up to 260 degrees C, which is equivalent in this range to roughly 100. 100 bar process uh, operation pressure. And for the low temperature cases between or below 250 degrees C, we could use graphite fins with horizontal tubes. And uh, beyond 250 degrees C, we have to go for aluminum fins because of the higher resistance of, of uh, the material. So far, we have tested more than five test modules between 140 uh, kilograms up to two tons of PCM material. The biggest one that we have installed meanwhile is a PCM storage that we have erected in Spain at a power plant in Carbonera with an inventory of 40 tons. And this one is operated since the end of 2010. So now we are coming to the current developments. For sensible heat storage, it is actually the state of the art arm for salt heat energy storage. And one problem is that we have a melting temperature in the range of 230 to 140 degrees C. And one aim is to reduce this melting temperature. And therefore, we are looking for salt mixtures with a reduced melting temperature. And at the moment, we have uh, salt mixtures identified that have a melting temperature in the range of, let's say, 70 to 80 degrees C by using uh, different cat, uh, cat irons and man irons. And uh, the way we can do it, or the way that most of the people are doing it now, is that they uh, investigate these phase diagrams for the potential uh, yeah, mixtures by high throughput methods. That, uh, yeah, and we are doing at the moment uh, the same and also other techniques. And so therefore we have, as I said, identified new wine mixtures with rest of the reduced melting temperatures of the range 80 degrees. Uh, another point is that most of our, a lot of the investment is caused by the two tanks of a modern salt storage technology and so therefore one approach is to use only one thermal energy tank and then you have a, uh, a, a so-called term applied storage system and this is completely with the salt, or the hot salt in the upper part of the system and the cold salt in the lower part. And one approach to reduce costs is to install or to use a kind of filler material with uh, let me say, uh, the, the desired thermal requirement, but also with a lower cost than you have for the salt. And this would be one approach to reduce the cost. And but one uh, problem is that you do not really have a very sharp border between the hot and the cold part, and so therefore you can only use or make the use of a, a part of this storage system and so therefore you cannot reduce the cost by let's say a factor of 50 percent but maybe if everything works fine you can reduce the cost by maybe 33 percent but so far you have own, or there are only some lab tests available and so you do not have any long-term experience and so therefore we are going in this direction to install a real demonstrator and try to investigate the operation behavior and to really Another point is, here you see the storage system as it is used for the uh, solar tower in Munich with the checker bricks, this, the uh, ceramic checker bricks. And this is one of the main cost drivers of the system because this uh, system is pressureless, so it's only a vessel that contains these checker bricks. And now we are going to uh, investigate different possibilities to replace these checker bricks that are quite expensive and uh, have a quite low thermal energy density. So we can use some construction materials like concrete stones or also a different kind of checker bricks that are similarly used also in the receiver system or by some saddles or natural stones, something like this. But doing this, you can increase the uh, uh, thermal energy density from 
at the moment, maybe in the range of 30, 40 kilowatt hours per square meter, up to more than 100 square meter, uh, kilowatt hours per cubic meter. And uh, this causes also different pressure loss situations in the system, for example, and so therefore we are doing some CFD analysis to uh, modify uh, the flow passes and optimize the pressure loss situation of the system. Or if you have these uh, pack bands with spheres, you have a, a very complex pressure load of the containment. And so therefore we are doing some FEM analysis to investigate the uh, mechanical load on the uh, vessel and also to modify the system in order to reduce the load of the system. So another point, as I said, for letter T storage or the DCM storage system is always uh, the problem to get relief from the fluid to the, to the storage medium, to the DCM medium. And so therefore we modified the, uh, let us say, parallel fins to longitudinal fins. Uh, so we did you see a setup of uh, extruded longitudinal fins of made of aluminum. Uh, two half sides and these are clamped on a uh, tube and by this we can increase the uh, heat transfer from the tube to the medium uh, significantly without uh, increasing the cost significantly. And one approach is of course to optimize the system. Optimize means to reduce the cost as far as possible without uh, uh, affecting the characteristic of the system. And so therefore we are doing some FEM calculations here using some we are one example for this situation. So and now I'm coming to my conclusion. So I want to tell you that there are different technical approaches <coughs> so there's not one unique, one single solution for all CSP systems. And the proven option at the moment is a tank on salt storage system which is applicable to temperatures of up to 560 degrees C and the storage capacity that has been built so far of uh, one gigawatt hours thermal. So, and then we have some demonstrated options, a concrete storage up to 400 degrees C and 300 to 400 kilowatt hours. And also a packed bed storage, which is, which is used in the solar tower in Munich, with, a, with temperatures up to 700 degrees C and a capacity of 1.5 kilowatt hours. The current activities are focusing on cost reduction. Everything has to become cheaper, and so we are focusing on the use of cheaper storage media, for example, concrete. Uh, we try to improve the performance characteristic by increasing the heat transfer from the fluid through the PCM medium. Or we use innovative storage medium like salt mixtures with reduced uh, melting temperature. And uh, we, do, we try to uh, use or uh, try to investigate innovative storage concepts like thermocline concepts aiming at the, let's say, commitment of the uh, second storage tank. So, and uh, this is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for your presentation, uh, actually our time, uh, so we have uh, still some minutes uh, for your questions, in case you have any, uh, please, uh, Dr. Selak. <coughs> Thank you for the presentation. Is there any maybe research about the life cycle or the month and so on? Uh, you mean a life cycle assessment by means of the uh, assessment of the environmental impact? No, no, what I mean that for how long time we can use the water and soil without replacement? Uh, yeah. And about how many cycles? Uh, so uh, at the moment uh, we, have, we have recently started this activity. That means we are investigating the, uh, not really the replacement rate, but the Uh, we are uh, performing temperature rising tests to investigate the, the, the mass loss of the system and we at the moment in let's scale we come to different uh, results as the industry uh, reports. The industry says, for example, Lima Solar and or Andersol, we do not have any degradation of the soil and we do not have any mass loss, we do not refill the soil over the whole lifespan, but at the moment they only have a, let's say, um, the operation experience of maybe one or two years, so this is not really, yeah. But as I said, we have recently started the activity to have a closer look to it and to really investigate and understand the decomposition processes in the sort because there are some. So you have uh, uh, NO2 and NO3 shifting with the uh, 
uh, yeah, to see a calling reaction. And so it's quite complicated, but at the moment it's not really understood. Okay, you want to follow up or is that okay? Okay, so we would have that is the, the next question or what would we could take at least one more question or a few of I don't know who was the first actually. Uh, but uh, we, we still have five minutes. We could okay. use it actually for the welcome. Yeah. Yeah, 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 thank you Dr. Dr. Marx for the informative presentation. My question, you mentioned you, one of your research trying to lower the, down the melting point. Yes. Uh, why is that? Are there any other sources of low melting point? Why do you want to lower the melting point? Uh, I didn't the you want to decrease the melting point. Yeah. My question is why? Uh, because the uh, high melting point uh, causes some, let's say, process problems. So uh, you always have to maintain the whole system above 250, 270 degrees C, which is, of course, the source of process, but also uh, it's a kind of problem because, for example, some people are looking for using more salt or more like solar fields, and then maybe you have a piping length of 80 or even 150 kilometers, and you have to maintain a temperature above 100 or 250 degrees C at every point in this huge field, that means in every valve, in every memory <coughs> section, in every pump, and this is really a challenge. So therefore it would be very helpful to have a salt that solidifies maybe below 100 degrees C. Okay, one more short question. Uh, when you go to Professor Kiwan, please make it short, please. So you might save some money on the storage medium side for the chloride, for the chloride even, but you put the money to the construction side because you have to use different materials, more sophisticated and more expensive materials. And so at the moment it's not really clear what is really the economic optimum. But the chloride might be pretty problematic in the, in the center of uh, corrosion. Can I ask another question? Um, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> we can, we can discuss uh, uh, let, let, let's discuss more about this in the cafe break, and that's my next uh, topic actually. Uh, you are all invited to the cafe break uh, in the nearby room uh, here uh, for the next 50, uh, 30 minutes. Please come back at um, uh, 20 past 12. 20 minutes, okay, 10 past 12, please. Uh, you have to come back here. Uh, thanks uh, once again to you for being here and all to the uh, panel uh, member. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. First of all, I, my name is Muti Beyet. I come from uh, Tunisia. I would like to thank very much organizers for uh, inviting me one to attend this uh, very very interesting conference and workshop second to chair this session we have three presentations 30 minutes each and we would like to start with Professor Joachim Fitting the title of this presentation is Energy Efficiency in Drinking Water Supply Systems. Mr. Bidding is uh, from the University of Applied Science of Westfalen in Germany. His research interest is water supply and industrial waste water treatment. He has published more than 50 articles. His experience is mainly in uh, sanitary engineering, research, and consultancy. Okay, the topic of my presentation is energy efficiency. 
So I'm not from the field of uh, solar power supply, but I was thinking about the causal connection between water and sun. And as you all know, the global water cycle is solar driven, but it's a natural process, of course. Uh, because of this process, we have freshwater resources on Earth, and it is probably the reason for uh, terrestrial life. I will give you a short overview. I will tell you a bit about uh, what is supply in Germany. I have to give you a short introduction of the elements of water supply systems, then I will focus on different approaches for energy efficient operation. And uh, a special topic will be energy recovery water mains, which has been uh, uh, interesting. Project and uh, different water utilities through the last uh, couple of years. And I will finish with a short summary. So, the water supply in uh, Germany is decentralized. We have about 6,700 uh, water works. So, almost every city, town, and any village can have a water supply system. Uh, a total of uh, 5.2 billion cubic meters a year is extracted uh, for this purpose, but this is only about 3% of the total annual renewable resources. So, Germany is a water rich country. And the public water supply is based on groundwater to about two thirds. Uh, we use also spring water and and here you can see the water consumption during the last uh, 20 years, and you see a decrease by almost 20% in this period. And this is uh, due to water conservation measures in households and uh, industries. Now the energy demand of water supply utilities a survey done uh, three years ago, and uh, here you see the total energy consumption versus uh, water production by many, many companies. And you see a certain dependency, of course, but there is also a large variation between different companies. The reason for this uh, is that there are different geographic uh, or topographic conditions within the supply areas. We have different structures, we have, of course, different water sources and water extraction uh, techniques. Uh, the requirements for water treatment uh, is different, and also the distribution system are designed in uh, different ways. So the characteristic data are that we have a mean specific energy consumption of about 0.5 kilowatt hours per cubic meter of water delivered. Uh, the 10th percentile is 0.18 kilowatt hours. The 90th percentile is almost 1 kilowatt per cubic meter. And the total energy consumption of water water supply utilities are 2.4 billion kilowatt hours. Now a short introduction to the elements of water supply systems. We have water abstraction, usually from wells, also affect surface water. A uh, large amount of surface water in Germany is extracted from wells close to rivers, we call that river location. Uh, the second element is water treatment, and uh, the third element is uh, water storage uh, close to the water works. Uh, the second part of the water supply system is water distribution, and it consists of pumping of water storage in. Uh, 
system, it can age, and it needs uh, frequent regeneration, and that is also important with respect to energy consumption, because the well that is not regenerated uh, experiences the lowering of the water level, and then you have to use more energy to pump the water to the surface. Uh, it is also important to minimize the head loss in the rising tide, for example, by not have too many belts in this uh, uh, part of the system and if uh, the water level is close to the surface you shouldn't use this type of pumps that are submerged uh, pumps you should rather use right place rotary pumps at the surface when water is treated it is also important to design and operate the treatment stages uh, accordingly. That means you should uh, prevent excessive head loss, you should backwash filter units in an energy efficient way. This is, by the way, such a filter unit is uh, Backwash water can be recovered by membrane filtration, and uh, at least in Germany, you often have humidity in waterworks water surfaces and uh, then you have to use energy to <coughs> remove humidity uh, from the inside air and uh, this can be prevented by uh, uh, avoid open water surfaces and then uh, one should use proper equipment to monitor the processes uh, <coughs> to evaluate the data even by simulation models, not by uh, this respect. Uh, here are some data about uh, the energy consumption in water treatment. That is, what hours per cubic meter of water treated, and you see in many cases uh, these numbers are very low. But you have here is some 100 watt hours per cubic meter, and here up to 800. And this is reverse osmosis we heard about before, with respect to desalination. But this is only for uh, freshwater desalination. If you desalinate seawater, you have to use up to 4,000 uh, watt hours per cubic meter or uh, 4 kilowatt hours per cubic meter. And this is an example of how the uh, water treatment process can be monitored. But I will not go into detail here because uh, I'm afraid I'm going to run out of time. When the water is instituted, uh, the first measure to uh, 
operating system efficiently in the optimization of pumps. That means uh, pumps have to be designed properly with respect to pumping head and flow rate needed. We should not focus on them, we should choose pumps with a very high efficiency with a flat characteristic curve when uh, you do not run the pump always at the optimum uh, point of operation. Uh, the pumps should be designed either for single operation or parallel <coughs> operation or for both. And uh, when the flow rates vary, one should use the pump that is RPM regulated, uh, not uh, a pump that is regulated by the uh, valve uh, that regulates the flow. Regular repair and maintenance I already mentioned. And also the driving motors for pumps should have a high efficiency. And uh, the last point, I will come to that uh, back later, is the replacement of old less efficient pumps in good time, uh, for this will be the payoff. Uh, one uh, uh, topic with respect to uh, pump operation is the monitoring of pump efficiency. And this can be done continuously when one measures flow rate and output pressure uh, with the pro uh, by appropriate sensors. Then you can use this uh, formula to calculate the actual pump efficiency. Uh, another way that is done at least in larger utilities is the so-called thermodynamic determination method. That means uh, that you determine the power loss by measuring uh, input and output temperature uh, of a pumping station. And uh, that means, uh, and see it from this formula, that uh, you just need pressure in and pressure out and the temperatures. You don't need the flow rate anymore. The flow rate is This uh, means, of course, that uh, the temperature has to be very uh, accurate. So this uh, shows uh, the results of uh, such a, a monitoring of the pump. Here you have the maximum efficiency, uh, 87%, and then we have the decrease of efficiency, in this case, 85%. The uh, lowest uh, limit that is acceptable, and here the pump is uh, revised, and you will always get back to the maximum efficiency. <coughs> In a study from Switzerland, one has found out that uh, electricity costs contribute to the annual costs of pumping by more than 90%. Capital cost is maintenance is less than 10%. And that means that it can be really beneficial to replace a older pump before the optimization period actually ends, because it will pay off very quickly. And another study revealed that pump optimization can give an uh, electrical energy saving by more than 20%. Uh, another point uh, uh, with respect to water distribution is the optimization of distribution networks uh, itself. That means that uh, one has to find measures to reduce the pressure loss, for example, by the optimization of flow velocities, by the establishment of different pressure zones, by the prevention of cowling effects, that increase friction losses inside the pipes. Uh, <coughs> again, the use of balls only where absolutely needed, and the use of RPM regulated pumps. Uh, those are data uh, that are uh, used in Germany for uh, water distribution. Uh, that is the uh, flow rate. 
in supply pipes and in building connections. Uh, you see a large variation, but it depends on the variation in water consumption uh, daytime and nighttime. And the pressure range is between 3 and 8 bar in rural areas and 4 to 8 bar in urban supply zones. Uh, in addition, you have to take hydraulic shocks into account, but the maximum pressure should not exceed 10 bar because otherwise the pipes can be damaged. Uh, when you have to uh, reduce uh, the flow rate, uh, then it can be done by uh, valves, low valves or, or gate valves, but uh, that means that the characteristic curve of the pump uh, without flow restriction this way will be come steeper. And that is the characteristic curve of the distribution network. Uh, so this is a working point without flow restriction. And this is the uh, working point with flow restriction. And if you look at the great characteristic curve of the pump, then <coughs> this point means that the pump will work at a lower efficiency. So one should actually try to avoid this. Uh, the third important uh, aspect of uh, uh, water network optimization is the minimization of water losses. Water losses are due to pipe damages, uh, to leakages, and pipe couplings, or to corrosion. And in Germany, we have actually an average loss of 6.8% uh, of the total water, uh, amount of water that is delivered. That means uh, about 300 billion cubic meters per year. And this is uh, equivalent to about 50 million kilowatt hours per year. Uh, those are characteristic data for water losses in urban and rural systems. Uh, one can try to uh, reduce water losses caused by maintenance of the uh, distribution network, but this is very cost intensive. So in Germany about 1.5 billion euros <coughs> per year are invested to maintain and uh, extend the distribution network. Another approach is pressure management. Uh, management. That means <coughs> uh, the systems are managed with system pressures, uh, that uh, the service is uh, ensured, uh, but uh, that too high pressures are avoided. And uh, <coughs> this means that uh, the amount of water that is <coughs> at least uh, Pressure management is done by so-called pressure-regulated valves. Those are <coughs> the Atrata valves or Thunder valves. And here is a typical arrangement. Uh, so this is a pipe, and we want to reduce the pressure. <coughs> and uh, the valve is introduced here. You have to need it. Uh, you have to construct a bypass. But usually, uh, the water is flowing this way. And there are uh, four different options to run such a uh, system. The first is a fixed outlet uh, that uh, the pressure regulated valve is uh, <coughs> maintained at a chosen level at all times. But this is a very static approach. It is better to uh, operate the valve according to the flow rate. This can be done, for example, by a time-based pressure modulation that maybe at night time when the flow rates are low, uh, the pressure is reduced only in these uh, hours. But it is more advanced uh, to modulate the pressure according to the flow than you have to, uh, to uh, monitor the flow <coughs> and uh, 
regulate uh, pressure from uh, The best option is the so-called remote control pressure modulation. Uh, that means you need uh, proper uh, instrumentation uh, with respect to the pressure. You need pressure sensors and at some critical points in the distribution systems, and uh, then you can uh, regulate the pulse so that the pressure is kept stable. Uh, the point that I already announced is energy recovery in water meters. Uh, the required condition is that uh, the pressure has to be reduced, for example, in water from a transport pipe is fed to a distribution network or in a water supply tank. And uh, in the old times, uh, just valves uh, uh, were used to uh, reduce the pressure, but <coughs> now turbines or modified centrifugal pumps running in the reverse are also applied. And uh, these can be used to produce energy. So here you see a uh, uh, typical sketch. Here you have a pipe to a, a, a storage tank. And uh, this is the, the head loss in the pipe. And uh, this pipe is uh, water head that you can use to produce energy. And uh, on the right side you see uh, such, a, uh, such a machine that is used to uh, reduce <coughs> and uh, get energy out of it. The main components of these systems are the already mentioned the turbine or the pump running in reverse with the generator of course. Uh, you need equipment to reduce hydraulic shocks uh, and it involves an electric battery control technology. Power output can be calculated according to this formula. Mm -hmm. uh, one has found out that there are different uh, <coughs> areas of application. Uh, <coughs> Here you see the uh, pressure head that is to be reduced and the flow rate. And this line marks the 30 kilowatt uh, energy generation. Below this, it doesn't make sense to use uh, uh, generate there, use turbines or pumps. And uh, this is a line uh, 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 representing. 400 kilowatt hours. And uh, above 400 kilowatt hours, a turbine is always the, the best option. But between 400 and 30 kilowatt, uh, you can use different types of pumps uh, as a cost efficient uh, alternative uh, to a turbine. And uh, the reason is that these pumps are much cheaper than turbines, but they have one. <coughs> Disadvantage. This is the, uh, their, their uh, specific characteristic curve. Here you see the efficiency of a pump running in a reverse. This is the characteristic curve of a turbine. Here is the flow rate. And uh, that means that you have to operate a pump always close to the uh, optimum flow rate. Uh, this shows the general design of such an uh, energy recovery unit. Here you have the water main, and you have to uh, place uh, this unit in a bypass, and you have to have a, a device that can reduce the hydraulic shock. For example, this in an expansion version. You can also use additional driving mass on the engine shaft. You can use controllable side outlets at the inlet pipe here, or you can use controllable brakes on the engine shaft again here. Uh, 
uh, you need uh, proper valves for the whole system uh, and uh, for the electrical which of you uh, use of a three phase uh, AC induction motor has uh, uh, turned out to be the best option. This is a practical example from the area of uh, Frankfurt. You have uh, water extraction at a height of about uh, 230 meters above sea level from two different sources of spring and uh, groundwater source. And here is uh, uh, the fed in point to the distribution system of Frankfurt, that is at about 100 meters above sea level. Uh, <coughs> And here, the pressure reduction uh, takes place. And uh, this shows some of the data. So you have 130 meters of uh, vertical height, a flow rate of uh, 4.3 million cubic meters a year, and pressure reduction has to be done from 12.5 bars to 5.5 bars. And for almost 100 years, uh, this uh, pressure reduction was done by a <coughs> valve. But uh, then the new system was constructed, it's a whole case of pump, a maximum flow rate of 440 cubic meters an hour, but with a height of 71 meters. The nominal power of the turbine is 70 kilowatt, efficiency uh, 82%. And about 500,000 kilowatt per year are used. Now I want to summarize. I <coughs> talked about we have a mean value of 4.5 kilowatt hours per cubic meter of specific energy consumption for water utilities in uh, Germany, but this uh, mean value is uh, not. characteristic for uh, utilities, so that is a sort of potential of optimization. Uh, there are general potential energy savings possible, and uh, here management tasks are uh, most important. Specific energy savings are possible by optimization measure, measures with uh, respect to wealth operation, water treatment, and Pump operation and of course the distribution network. Uh, specific attention should be paid to water loss reduction. And uh, energy recovery in water mains should always be considered as an alternative to the use of pressure reducing valves. I want to acknowledge the handbook of energy efficiency and energy savings in water supply systems. That was published two years ago by the German Technical and Scientific Association for Gas and Water in co collaboration with the EU. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Fitting, for this very presentation. We can have some questions. Yeah, five minutes. Yes, is there a mic? Oh, you can. Okay, here, not my mic. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much for the presentations. In fact, uh, before I would like to ask to give you some data about Jordan here. We, we have about 15% of our electricity goes to only water pumping in Jordan, which is a huge quantity, I think that. And about the water losses, I think that the percentage that we have is more than 40%. So you mentioned about 6.8 in Germany. I think that this is a very, very nice figure that, in the, in the, I think, for, for us, I think that there is damage in the pipe, piping network, and there is some maybe illegal usage of water. I don't know if for also in Germany, is it this the second best or 6.8? Only damages in piping network, or also there is some also illegal uh, 
loses your water without bill or something like that. As far as I know, there is no illegal use of water in Germany. <clears throat> because uh, the water utilities are responsible for all the pipes uh, to, the, to the households. And they have their uh, uh, water meters, so each household has its own water meter. And this is controlled every year. And uh, I have uh, no knowledge about illegal use of water. Okay, uh, my, my question is about what is your recommendations, for example, to like a country like Jordan, how they can control the, to reduce this leakage of water, which is between 40 and 50 percent. Yeah, first of all, you have to find, find out uh, what is the reason is for the leakages. Is it pipe material that is not uh, stable? Is it uh, the, the way you uh, build the network? That means uh, that, that you have no proper bedding of the pipes. They, they get pressure from uh, the, the surface and break easily. Uh, there are different reasons for, for leakages. That you have to find out and then you can apply pressure management uh, as far as I know, there has been such a, a pilot project in Jordan as well. And of course, uh, 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 one can also apply the uh, reduction uh, uh, of uh, flow rate in a way that you don't supply uh, uh, people for 24 hours a day, seven days a week, that you can also reduce all but uh, it's, it's no easy answer. You have to know your system, you have to know the reasons for linkages and losses. Okay, the second question is. This is Suzanne Lahan from Arabic Libani. Maybe I have a little bit an answer for you, Dr. Ahmad. The main uh, the reason for uh, uh, for uh, uh, the high leakage in, in our network is an old network, actually. And uh, the, uh, almost before uh, 30 or 50 years, we're talking about iron or steel for using. And nowadays, we have uh, uh, like a regular uh, water supply uh, schedule for every for every area or district, whatever. So when we are stopping uh, supply the water for these districts, it affects the line itself, and maybe it it, uh, it, it consumes the pipeline. So we need we have a high percentage leakage in, in water supply system in Jordan. Miahuna and the privatization in Jordan. Uh, water system, uh, we have a successful story in Amman especially, it was about 60% and now after Lima and the Miyavna company, it, it reduced to about 35 to 38%, which is very good. Uh, also Miyavna, they did a um, them called non-revenue water, which divided Amman to the district and they tried to uh, study uh, on the field why we have these, these problems. Uh, uh, meanwhile, we have uh, illegal uses, but after they make a, a huge survey, especially in Amman, it was very limited, actually. Maybe we can find these uh, illegal uses in um, uh, the countryside more. It's like the wells for irrigation purpose, and it's noticeable in some, some places here in Jordan. Um, this is uh, some, uh, uh, maybe the answer of your question, actually. But now I have a question. It's, uh, we have a major issue here in our big station in Jordan that uh, most of our groundwater or the water points, uh, uh, water points in Jordan, it's it's down downstream in in Lahore area or Jordan Valley, and we are going for pumping this water to Amman. Uh, we're talking. I don't know if it's the right number in my, in my mind now, it's about 100 meters. We bump the water from Zara Ma'in to Amman. Million, million. 
several million, we're talking about 750, it's, it's very high. So uh, the head, the main, the main issue, and the queue, it's, it's very high because we supply Amman as the capital of Jordan. Um, uh, we're talking about energy efficiency because uh, sometimes they're talking about one million Jordan dinar as a bill, electricity bill for this pumping. And it affects direct or indirect the water cost per cubic meter in Jordan. Uh, what, what the new ideas, uh, what the solutions do you think in your, uh, in your opinion that we can make energy efficiency in such as this, uh, this case of Amman or Jordan? Well, I think that is your simple answer because the water is down there and you need it up there. So we have to pump it up. And uh, you have to find uh, energy efficient pumps. You have to do all the uh, maintenance on them and, and uh, yeah, try to, to optimize the, the operation. So I know that uh, students from our university will be here in April, May, June with the German Association for International Development and working is actually on this uh, uh, issue of uh, pump optimization. But there is no, no easy answer. And you always have to, to work on, on small improvements, but it will pay, pay off uh, uh, the, the, the years that come. Okay. Well, we yeah. Perhaps the last question? Yeah. Or there is okay. Last before the last. In electrical distribution, they use the smart grid system. No. Hello. In electrical distribution, they they use the smart grid system in order to control and manage the distribution of electricity. What kind of system do you use in order to manage the losses and manage the distribution of water in general? There, there is no, no um, um, constant monitoring of, of uh, uh, the system. I mean, you have uh, uh, water losses and you, you can try to find out where it is. You find them of course when there is a, a break of a main. Uh, then you have a high contain and you have to uh, <coughs> fix it immediately. But if you have a small leakage it can take a long time until you will detect it. So there are some detection methods that are applied but it is or it can be quite difficult to find uh, those small leakages. Now maybe if we can discuss in the break, because it's a very uh, special question. Yes, the last question, please. Yeah, that's it. Thank you for your presentation. I uh, can mention for uh, about your uh, one number, uh, 0.51 kilowatt hour per meter square per cubic meter used for uh, water consumption. Can you mention about international figures? How much international use? I'm sorry, I cannot because I think this is a very a new issue for water supply. In Germany, the study was done three years ago, and I have not seen numbers <laughs> from other countries on this issue. Yeah, so I, I can't give you an answer. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Fetting. Let's go to the second presentation. It will be presented by uh, Dr. Noel Quaider. I think he is Rania uh, Tarif. Everybody knows uh, NUA. The title of this presentation is CSP Project Planning and Project Types. Um, you, you have the floor. Thank you, Thank you. Um, So it's uh, afternoon, so good afternoon, everybody, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my presentation now will take you somewhere else than the other presentation, straight as one. 
sorry for this contract, um, but I hope that you enjoy it. So, um, originally I have planned this presentation to include uh, project types and um, uh, project planning. <coughs> but I have changed my mind actually to give you, or to try to give you at least, uh, uh, bigger or the, the, the whole picture about the direction of CSP power plants. Let me know how the things uh, function. But before starting with my uh, presentation, we have to agree in two uh, basics. Uh, the first one is CSP power plant is a power plant. It means most, if not all, um, uh, <coughs> processes, methodologies used, or even legal. Um, to erect a normal, conventional uh, power plant and uh, could be used or should be used also uh, to plan and implement a CSP and, uh, power plant, solar thermal power plant. Uh, the second um, uh, thing which we have to agree upon that everything in this in, uh, presentation um, is about general guidelines. So it's not uh, a master plan. Uh, to build any CSP power plant, so every project will have its own specific specialty, so um, it varies. Um, my presentation um, uh, will include uh, the following points. Uh, I will um, uh, make an overview about pro um, project types. And now we are talking in general power plants. Um, um, then we'll go through a carpet finance project, uh, project finance project, IPP project structures, and go through to that and um, to, uh, to the implementation phases, to initial project phase, uh, project recruitment phase, uh, to project execution phase, and finally operation and maintenance phase. So I'll try to um, put that fast. Uh, this presentation uh, represents um, uh, all the stuff. Information. It, it's a big stuff, but I have tried to compress all of these in 30 minutes um, uh, presentation, all this information. Um, I'll start um, uh, with the very basics about the um, uh, power plant uh, project. And uh, we have two types of um, uh, projects here. So we have the corporate finance or so called APC uh, model, which is engineering, recruitment, and uh, construction model. And the second one is uh, project finance, uh, or IPP model, which is uh, very uh, typical uh, here in Jordan. So uh, we have a changing role for the public and um, uh, private sector in, uh, uh, for these two project types. If we start with project uh, with public sector, we see that uh, in the EPC model, uh, the public sector um, uh, uh, finance construct the plan, so it has its assets, so it owns uh, the plan, it is specified the input parameters, uh, technically and financially as well. It uh, controls um, everything through ownership, as I mentioned. Um, uh, on the other hand, um, in the IPP scheme, uh, uh, public um, uh, sector, uh, has the following role, uh, which um, is specifying the output parameters, for example, the quality and the price of the um, uh, electricity, and it controls um, uh, the, the, the operation and the output through regulation. If we go to the private sector and see the different roles uh, now, um, um, for corporate finance, we see that the private sector um, its, it's uh, role is very limited in this uh, field and it's limited to, uh, for example, APC uh, role uh, for engineering, recruitment, and construction role. Um, uh, on the other hand, for the IPP scheme, the private sector owns the plan, operates it, and finances it. So uh, it, it has the, uh, of the, the whole um, power on the plan. Um, this um, uh, scheme shows you um, um, the typical structure of um, uh, APC model, which is um, uh, now corporate uh, financing structure. And we see in the heart of this structure the utility, which is the electricity company, um, uh, which is directly or indirectly affiliated with the government. 
and this utility um, uh, is connected uh, with lenders um, uh, from which it gets money, uh, for example, development map, banks or national banks, regional banks or whatever. Um, uh, this utility um, awards um, um, the construction of any power plant, uh, either CSP or conventional, to APC contractor. Uh, which builds the power plant um, um, down the right, if you can see, and purchases um, uh, the, the, the electricity again to the utility, which owns this plant. Um, the characteristics of this um, uh, model, the APC model, is um, uh, following that the, the utility has several income um, uh, sources. It has no problem with getting finance for uh, its project. So uh, um, they can finance a project, for example, um, in, in most of MENA countries, the uh, Middle East, uh, in North Africa, um, uh, utilities finance their own projects. Um, the second point, um, they, they, they are referred to the so-called unbalanced uh, um, uh, sheet financing because they have their income and expenditure and they have their own uh, cash flow sheet. So, they use that on balance sheet to finance um, their new project and that's why uh, their, their projects are simple. Simple, the, um, the, the cost of the uh, execution of this project is cheaper because uh, there are actually no much entities who are um, um, in, 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 in involved in, the, in this process which um, are, who are um, 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 uh, asking for um, money for this, their services, so everything is in house. And finally, the structure is very flexible. Uh, that reflects the unbalanced uh, sheet. And uh, the third point is the erection of uh, a CSP power plant is done normally through APC contractor. That's why it's called APC model. And finally, the APC contractor in this case is. He gets the whole set from the utility or from the government, technical set of information, the finance, and he has <coughs> only to make the uh, construction, um, uh, to start with the engineering cost, procurement of everything in this project, uh, through co uh, construction, and finally to commissioning of the power plant. So it's a subcontractor, um, more or less. Here we can see the IPP structure, the typical IPP structure, and here we see it's um, uh, more complicated, a little bit more complicated. So we see the project company in the heart of this structure. Uh, the project company is also called uh, a special purpose uh, vehicle. So it's a company made only for this purpose, uh, to, to make uh, this power plant and to administer this power plant. Um, uh, this company normally um, uh, is shared between the government and the developer. So these two parties um, um, uh, owning the company, normally in the MENA region we are talking about uh, 50 to 60 percent of the share for the government and the rest would be then um, uh, owned by the um, uh, developers and investors. Of course there could be other local parties. Uh, this project company um, is bound with um, um, a lot of agreements, for example, um, uh, loan agreements uh, with lenders, so there is a loan agreement with a land lease agreement um, uh, if, because they need um, uh, a land for uh, their power plan, and um, uh, with the um, uh, concession agreement with the government, for example, uh, Federal Reef uh, and so on, and um, APC agreement with the APC contractor, there is also the APC contractor, could be one of the developers, by the way. Um, and uh, there, there, there must be operation maintenance agreement as well with that another company which, or one of these companies who will run and uh, maintain the power plant and in case of hybridization they need a fuel uh, supply agreement and um, the PPA which is power purchase agreement which is the most important agreement in this uh, uh, among these agreements and, you, 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 and uh, it's uh, very well known that this agreement defines the whole setup of this uh, project, actually. And you won't be surprised if you know that this agreement will be made uh, back to back to the APC agreement and 
uh, uh, in, uh, operation and maintenance agreements. So we're talking about expenditure and money that you, you'll get later on. So that's the entire setup of the project. Um, okay, so the, um, I'll move the, uh, to the second slide, and here we can see uh, an example of um, uh, IPP structure. Um, um, and here you can see the Shams Park company, Park Land company in, uh, in, in Abu Dhabi. So it's, uh, as I mentioned, a share between uh, uh, the uh, Abu Dhabi government. It's Abu Dhabi Future Energy Company, uh, which owns 60% uh, and the developer, Total, uh, the French Total and the Spanish Avenue Company, and all related agreements, uh, as I mentioned uh, in the previous slide. The characteristics of uh, the IPP structure, it has uh, many advantages, this structure, despite of the complexity. So, um, um, the countries, the first characteristic is the countries have, uh, are provided with the opportunity to finance projects without involving their own money. But also, uh, or finally, we will benefit from the know-how standard because they will involve um, uh, 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 developers of uh, technology who will transfer their know-how to this country and will benefit um, uh, the uh, know-how standard in this country. Um, um, however, there, there are prerequisites for these um, uh, for the private sector in, 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 in general to come here and invest. It. Um, for example, they need a stable political and economic environment to put their money. Uh, here, so there, there must be also clarity uh, in national and regional laws and regulations to, to let them know where they invest and where, uh, uh, what they get at the end of the day. And they're, 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 it's uh, favorable as well to get a strong capital, um, a domestic capital market in order to allow these developers or the, the, the project company to borrow money from the local banks. Right? Um, transparency, easiness, and fast processing is very important a criteria uh, to, 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 to um, uh, enable these um, uh, people or the developer to invest here or, or to, 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 to go through this, um, uh, to follow this uh, structure because um, it is uh, very important for the money lenders, for the um, know-how companies to see uh, really from the early beginning um, a very clear structure how the things will go on and um, uh, to have everything clear in order to uh, be able to calculate their turnover uh, in a few years later. So um, um, there must be a fair, a fair share of risk between government and private sector, it's uh, legitimate as well. And um, there should be uh, also realistic incentives from the government to um, um, encourage the private sector and uh, foreign uh, companies uh, to come and invest. For example, the fide tarif or the power purchase agreement. So the, uh, and this um, uh, payment scheme uh, should be clear for the next uh, 15 to 20 years, the, the operation condition, in order to tell them, okay, everything will remain the same, you will have money because they, they, they don't want to uh, to transfer know-how only, they want to earn money. So, uh, I don't know what happened now. <laughs> okay. No, no, no. It's not my time. Okay, so um, uh, now the IPP structures, um, um, uh, which could be um, uh, taken into consideration, here there are many structures um, and all of them uh, or most of them contain the design, build, operate, transfer, lease, uh, own and uh, so on. And the most important two structures are build, own, operate, BOO, or build, own, operate and transfer. Uh, transfer means in this uh, sense is to transfer the ownership after uh, maybe 15 to 20 years uh, of the uh, power plant to the government or to the utility. So there are the uh, typically followed schemes of uh, structures. Um, now I, I, I would like to go uh, to the second part of my presentation, uh, which is the project implementation. How could we implement the CTP project? 
um, a typical CSP project uh, um, includes um, um, the, the following four phases. The initial project phase, the recruitment phase, execution phase, and operation and maintenance phase. So the first uh, phase um, uh, um, is the initial project phase. So here we have to uh, know about the site, for example, and to uh, conduct um, uh, feasibility studies. Uh, is it okay actually to invest in that location uh, for that project or not? And finally, it includes the conceptual, um, conceptual design study, if required uh, in this case, uh, either APC or IPT structure, so it, it makes a difference. Um, I'll go through these steps uh, uh, um, uh, very fast. Um, in, and the site selection study is the first thing to do for such project. Um, uh, the purpose here is to select the most suitable site um, uh, for the proposed CSP project in the area of interest. For example, here in Jordan, uh, this has been done. And I think uh, Ma'an area is uh, the, the most attractive uh, region. But we're in Ma'an and now uh, should be included here. Level of details. Um, um, here, um, um, it depends upon actually the available information. But you need to know that um, uh, solar resources, I, I, I have the diagram of the table down, uh, the slide uh, about the uh, selection criteria, so you have to know that the solar resources in this side are good uh, or enough, uh, the infrastructure is available, um, and uh, infrastructure, for example, the grid connection, because you need to feed in your uh, generated electricity, so you don't have to build a new grid for that. Uh, site access, because it's a big project and you need um, uh, uh, available uh, road network. Water availability for, water, uh, for cleaning, uh, as well as wood cooling in case of, um, uh, and so on. So the last characteristic, important characteristic, is land uh, characteristics. And uh, it's about the availability and size, uh, topography and land coverage. Work. It's uh, very simple to know that this land is good enough for, um, to uh, erect or to um, construct uh, this um, CSP project there. And um, you are lucky here in Jordan because you don't have uh, much hilly areas in the southern desert, so it's almost flat area, so it's um, uh, suitable, mostly in uh, uh, the next step would be the pre-feasibility study, and here it, it has the, um, uh, the, the main purpose to, um, to be the base or a base for decision making uh, with a little bit of um, uh, technological data inside. So the level of detail, uh, we're talking about um, several project options, which technology, for example, uh, should be implemented here, and so on. Um, um, the third phase, uh, phase here, or the third thing to do uh, in the initial project phase, we are still in the initial project phase, is the feasibility study, which is the most important component in this uh, uh, phase, and it tells us, um, uh, or it goes in depth, uh, investigation <coughs> of most promising pro project configuration. For example, okay, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll do that with parabolic draft technology or solar power, uh, um, uh, tower technology and with the storage and so on and it goes into technical details. So it, it maybe you notice every phase and uh, in every phase, uh, further phase, you go further deep in technical details um, uh, and it helps us uh, to um, assess uh, the um, uh, several project of um, to, uh, sorry, it helps us to prepare a bankable report. What is a bankable report? Bankable report comes from banks, so if, if you bank, so if you present it to the bank, you could get uh, a loan for that, you, get, you could get the money for that, so it's the level of uh, required information. Um, in this stage, actually, after the feasibility study stage, uh, the, 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 the decision should be made in this stage, either IPP or APC structure, uh, or project uh, should be implemented, or will be implemented in case we uh, we we'll go for EPC um, uh, model, uh, public uh, sector model, you will need conceptual design study, 
which gives more technical details for the APC contractor later to build exactly what the utility wants to be built. Uh, because in, uh, in the APC uh, model, uh, the utility defines exactly what should be built. The IPP scheme or structure, uh, the private sector or the developers have more uh, uh, freedom to decide what, uh, what should be uh, built based, of course, in uh, cost uh, criteria. And, um, and but here, conceptual design based on um, performance criteria. So um, I'll, I'll go further now to the second phase, which is the recruitment phase, um, which includes the pre-qualification, uh, request for proposal, and, uh, clarification and negotiation of the contract, <coughs> bid evaluation, and finally the contract negotiation. Uh, you won't be surprised to hear many financial spend, uh, terms uh, in this presentation because um, there is a lot of money involved in such projects. So uh, it's, um, it has um, a very complicated uh, financial scheme as well. So um, I'll start with a brief uh, qualification process. It's, uh, uh, now we know exactly what we have to do, or uh, exactly what we have to do and where. And now we will look for somebody who will do this. So uh, the, the, the first step is to um, uh, launch the so-called pre-qualification process and why to inform all bidders in, in the market about uh, uh, the important aspects of the project to convey seriousness of the intent to pursue. Because if you, if, if you um, uh, tell uh, all bidders about the project and you filter uh, these bidders, you will get at the end of this stage uh, the most serious bidders uh, to be uh, considered for construction. And in this regard, I have to mention that uh, the, the, the final selected bidder number uh, mustn't be um, too much, either too much uh, nor um, uh, very few. So three will be okay, two is very few, and uh, more than five will be too much because the winning chances will be decreased and so that uh, seriousness uh, for the bidders to um, uh, prepare the uh, required documentation will be decreased. Um, uh, so um, the, the pre-qualification um, um, uh, process um, has also many um, uh, issues, for example, um, um, issue the invitation to pre or steps uh, the, the invitation to pre-qualification, establish criteria and rules, for example, who will wear uh, just normal rules, prepare request for qualification, RFQ, and then uh, pre-qualify the bidders based on uh, these criteria, which are very important for the project company in this case for the developer or uh, for the uh, utility. So uh, this um, um, uh, entity has to know about the financial strength of the bidder. If the, um, uh, how, how is the credit rating, historical financial performance, the size, the privilege, the profitability, uh, uh, profitability and so on. And it, it has to know uh, about experience, which is the most important part of this criteria. So uh, this uh, APC company uh, or technology company uh, should uh, know how to do uh, the job the best way. So uh, it's an open market, so you can... Mine just come down to about uh, 600, 700 euros. Two years later, it's, it's now reduced in general. So it was uh, cut at about 10 to 20 percent as an average value. So there's uh, much uh, progress, especially also on the social side, to reduce the, the, the invest, the prices, due to the fact that more chinos are now sold and that um, the chino manufacturers are now producing more chinos at lower cost, of course. Um, I just would like to show you the market shares for solar cooling systems. Um, absorption technologies are about 70% uh, of the overall solar cooling systems which are already installed. 30% uh, are using adsorption technology. And then we have two other technologies which were not mentioned now in the presentation yet, which are so-called open systems, DC systems based on solid sorptions or liquid sorptions as well. Um, I will show you some further information on that in the presentation tomorrow. But in general, 
the technology which is used in, um, for solar cooling systems more or less is absorption technology. At the end, I just would like to uh, inform you that there is an association uh, formed in the year 2009 in Berlin, in Germany, just to promote now such cheers, um, especially in Europe, but also worldwide, um, to just um, to bring it forward to um, to develop the different markets. And if you are interested to get further information, especially on the for subject cheers. You can just visit the website, which is uh, www.greenshield.eu. There you will get further information and a lot of different links where you can just easily uh, collect further data and information. Um, just to conclude, um, there are now several new small scale chillers on the market absorption and adsorption chillers, as you have uh, seen before. Um, for adsorption chillers, the electric CUP is about four to five times higher than for the absorption chillers, you have also seen that, uh, due to the fact that the power consumption of those chillers is quite low, in the range of about 20 to 30 watt, but uh, the thermal COP is about 25% lower than of uh, absorption chillers. And the uh, specific cooling power for both technologies is in the range between 25 to 30 watt per kilogram uh, and 20 to 40 for the absorption. Uh, in general, I would say that um, really if you have, um, would like to um, think about such solar cooling system, you should, uh, should really think about uh, your application temperature levels and so on. Uh, not using only the nominal uh, data which is available on the product flyer which we have now used for that comparison, but please really have a look on your application what temperature levels uh, you would like to achieve and what you can provide from your solar site, for example, to get at the end the real data for your design. So with that, I would like to thank you for the attention and yeah, thanks. Thank you. Now, because we are running late, we will only allow for two quick questions. Yes, please. year about 95 million units for compression chillers and those companies they have installed last year about 400 systems so you can easily calculate it it's about zero yeah. Thank you. Yeah, welcome. Thank you. now we'll move to the next presentation It'll be about uh, district university network in academic cooperation RE will be presented by Mr. Waldi Mel uh, from uh, Desert Tech University Network, Desert Tech Foundation, and he's a National Advisory Council for Scientific Research in Tunisia.
first, uh, a quick presentation of the DizaTech concept. You know, if everybody heard about DizaTech. What is DizaTech? Maybe many, uh, many meanings of uh, DizaTech word, but basically, it's first, it's a vision, it's a concept, it's a kind of. Uh, it's not a project, but let's say it's a concept. It uh, starts from the uh, perspective of the energy demand in the Vienna companies. Uh, is it okay for the people? Yeah? Okay. This chart shows uh, the uh, future demand for energy con uh, conception, uh, energy consumption for the Vienna companies is the perspective of year 2005. You see that it's a mix, it shows a mix of energy between the conventional energy and uh, renewable energy, solar, wind, and so on and so forth. And you see that the demand will be, will be increased exponentially. It will be uh, multiplied by six from year 2010 to until 2050. It means that for our own development as MENA countries, we need a lot of people. Second point is a comparison between the demand of uh, energy and uh, mainly for electricity in the uh, European countries. Again, it's, uh, it, it shows the mix of energy and uh, between the various sources, even nuclear and coal and uh, so on and so forth. And uh, what we can say here is if you compare between the two charts, the if in the MENA region, the, the increase will be quite exponential. In the European countries, it will be stable and uh, even it will be decreased uh, between uh, year 2004 until 2050. That's one point. Second is the, uh, is the demand of uh, energy between, uh, compared between the uh, MENA countries and the European countries will be almost equivalent by year 2050. Third parameter of the Etizate concept is that to reduce the, uh, the, the uh, greenhouse gas in Europe by 30%, which is the aim and the objective, uh, by uh, year 2050, the European countries will need to import about 15% of their own electricity consumption from green sources. That means from deserts. That's really how the, the first basic elements uh, for the construction of the uh, desertic concept. Uh, and I like very well this map. It shows two things. One, you have here the DNI uh, for uh, the, the shot and the DNI of the various countries for the MENA, countries from, uh, from Morocco to uh, Egypt and uh, Jordan and uh, Saudi Arabia, etc. And the, of course, the highest rate of DNI is on this, uh, this uh, region. But it shows the network. These connections are have you know, two meanings, I may say. You know, one is the connection, the grids between the uh, MENA countries and the grids, the electric grids uh, within the European countries, and the red dots are the sources 
of generation of electricity and the red dots, the, the green, excuse me, the green dots are the uh, sources of uh, the protect, uh, production of electricity, which are in the south, and the red dots are the consumption. And between north and south, you have from bridges which to uh, connect the grids between the two regions. That's the that a concept, if I may say. One, it's for our own need for our development. Uh, the demand is, uh, is increased you know, with, a, with a very high rate. Second, there is possibility to export the electricity from south to north. Many people, you know, make a confusion and say this attack is for export. It's not for export. First, basically, for our own needs. <clears throat> That's the this attack concept. Now, how we can achieve that? The technology is there. For renewable energy, you know, that the various technologies, photovoltaic, uh, concentrated solar power, wind, and uh, the various technologies within uh, the each, you know, big uh, technology, we know that the technology is there, is here for the generation of electricity. The technology is here for the transport. Okay, this, uh, this map shows that uh, each, that almost 90% of the world population is, uh, lives within a distance less than 3,000 kilometers from any desert in the world. That means that we can carry the uh, electricity produced from uh, any desert to any place, almost. How we can do it? <coughs> now the transport, the technology is uh, again here through uh, undersea or underground cables with high voltage uh, telecurrent, which is the technology the most uh, common. Okay, that's very good. We have the technology, we have the concept. Now let's stop and uh, have a quick SWOT analysis of this concept. On what extent it is reachable, what will be the strength, weaknesses, the opportunities, the threats of them. There are many, uh, in fact, there are many uh, SWOT analysis for the data concept. I have choose this one. Uh, let's look at the strengths, comprehensive long-term vision. We are talking about vision uh, towards 2050. Largely existed technology bases. We have seen that the technology is, is, is there for uh, generation as well as for transport. There is solid perspectives for future learning effects, technology advances and declining cost levels. You know that uh, you, you are witnessing uh, the uh, decrease of the costs. Direct involvement of the private sector. Companies are involved in that. The II, the Tech Investment Initiative, Medgate, as an example of consortiums of investors involved in that. Propitious political timing, perhaps. You know, you know the, what is happening now. Best of the sense. Again, there is opportunities. Positive economic effects and uh, economic growth, employment, industries, technology transfer. There is a study conducted by the World Bank with the country that there is really opportunities in terms of socio-economic uh, effects. Synergies and trade-offs among participating countries and institutions. Energy security and sustainable development. Less dependency of fossil fuels, of course, and exposures to external risks. Kick off research activities and programs in Europe and MENA region. I just uh, started with the positive and uh, which uh, with the strengths and opportunities. Let's now look at the weaknesses and the threats. The 
use of lack of established lead technology. We don't know yet what will be in the next decades really the lead technology. There is many technologies, there is many sub-technologies in, in each technology. We, we are not sure what will be the lead technology. In some extent, there is a degree of insecurity, future policy preferences, energy costs, technology, technological progress, lack of a European energy consensus on import. It's very important. We are talking about exporting uh, electricity, uh, green electricity from south to north, but the regulation, the European regulation, is not yet really very, very clear. You know? for those who, who are familiar with that, the famous Article 9 of the Energy Directive of the uh, European uh, Community. High upfront costs and slow return ratio of solar plants. We don't know really what will be the return on investment on some solar plants yet, <coughs> right now. Still prevailing top-down approach relative neglect, socio-political and economic aspect. Yeah. And we, we, will, we will talk, we will uh, come back to this issue, it is very important. Shy reference to inclusive applications, water, transport, mobility, that's the, the, the there is no enough stress on these applications. If, if, which are really very, very important, like uh, water, of course, but uh, mobility, sport, uh, transport, e-mobility, etc. <laughs> okay, that's how uh, sustainable amount of public subsidies is needed. It's not easy to finance, you know, this huge project. Delay in cost reduction results. Skepticism and mistrust. Some say that it's it's uh, going to take time. Slow public acceptance. And again, <coughs> I will come back to this. How it can help you know to go through these issues and this what analysis? That's the mission of the Desertec Foundation. It is a foundation which has been founded uh, on uh, early uh, year 2009. And you know that uh, there is uh, from the founders of this foundation, a very, very prestigious man from Jordan, who is Prince Hassan in Palais. And uh, the Digital Tech Foundation had uh, its main aim is to implement the Digital Tech concept through what we call initiatives. The first initiative is industrial initiative. And it is, uh, it's in fact the DII, the Desertec Industrial Initiative, which is a consortium which now uh, there is 50 uh, big companies involved in renewable energy and uh, which gather with just, you know, say how we can do, what we can do to implement the Desertec concept. There is Political initiatives, as you may okay, as you may imagine, that there is political issues, there is regulation to adapt to this, uh, uh, to uh, this the, for the implementation of this concept. Public initiative, public awareness, public acceptance, uh, uh, social analysis how the population, the civil society, will uh, act uh, before and facing uh, this uh, big uh, project. And last but not least, the academic initiative. That's the main objective of the uh, Desertec University Network. Now coming to the Desertec University Network, it is a network which brings together research and academic of universities, engineering school from MENA region and from Europe which are interested in and capable of contributing to the implementation of this concept. Second objective is to promote 
the development of human resources so that energy systems can be constructed with a maximum of local products and services. Third is contribution to the design, the manufacture, the installation, the operation and maintenance of future, future desertic energy systems. Our mission, international cooperation of course, research and development, dissemination and promotion of technology and knowledge, support of the creation of local enterprises. Our fields of activities, renewable energy of course and their application, mainly solar, wind, water dissemination, mobility, energy efficiency, environment security, socio-economic effects. We have put for ourselves our work, uh, work program priorities, which are mainly first is master programs, academic cooperation through master programs and, and programs and through developing the capacity building in our region. Addressing the public, public awarenesses and acceptance for renewable energies in general and the Tizatec concept in particular. It is very, very important. We know from the, uh, uh, the Tunisian Spain and then I can say the Arab speak, but the thing is that if a project is not completely appropriated, accepted by the population, by the uh, civil society, soon, sooner or later, it will have some problems. And we are daily uh, living this uh, principle in Tunisia. Socioeconomic effects in terms of uh, what kind of industries we can create in our countries, what kind of uh, technology transfer, what will be the importance of the employment for in uh, our countries, and some technological issues which are very, very sensitive in our region, how we face uh, the uh, sandstorms, how uh, we can improve the uh, cleaning technology for mirrors, dry cooling, uh, comparing with water cooling, and if you implement these large systems in deserts, they maybe have some water problem. Uh, what kind of system we have, we chose for a particular uh, location, is it the CSP, is it the PV, what kind of CSP, etc, etc. There are some issues in our local program. I have time? Two minutes, okay. Back to the academic and the master programs. Survey of, uh, we are doing three uh, main actions. Survey of relevant existing programs. Promoting such programs among students from MENA and addressing the barriers and ways to overcome uh, these barriers to allow our students to uh, attend these programs. We have now on the table about 20 programs identified to uh, work with some universities and uh, uh, to uh, uh, select students to go and uh, have these uh, problems. Uh, the, pro the problem is what problems, where and how. Capacity building, development of new courses within Europe and MENA, addressing the specific needs of academia and industry in the field of uh, renewable energy and energy efficiency, creating synergy between Europe's Europe and MENA region, enhance the scientific level of the courses and develop the infrastructure within our institutions. Okay, that's okay for next one. PPP, <coughs> private-public partnership, identify and enroll stakeholders, public authorities, academic community and industry and civil society. 
that that is the main features of our working program for the next year. Thank you very much. Okay, we have now questions. Yes, please. Again, uh, this is not a project, it's a concept, it's a vision. Okay. Uh, now, you are addressing the price of, uh, so the, your question, the price of the kilowatt hour produced through renewable energy. You know, each project has its answer. You know, there, there is not a, you know, a, a general answer from this uh, question of defense in uh, Jordan, maybe price in Tunisia, in Algeria, and uh, there is no fixed price for that. It depends on the price of the the, uh, the, the uh, present price in each country, you know, for uh, by utilities, and it depends on the situation of the project, technology, or we, we, there is no unique uh, unique response to that. Okay. More questions? Okay, we will move to the last presentation this day by Dr. Suhail Kiwan. It will be about energy research activities in Jordan. Dr. Suhail is a professor of mechanical engineering and the director of Energy Center at Jordan University of Science and Technology. He holds a PhD in mechanical engineering and from ITT Chicago. Now, in engineering, we have 20,000 students. 
not 200,000. 20,000 students are in engineering, and are, among them, 3,006 are graduate students. Now, if you look at engineering and architecture students, uh, we are talking about 63% in the BSc program, uh, graduate around 15% uh, and 22% in the community colleges. Graduate students distribution, uh, I mean, uh, this is the PhD and higher diploma level. We have higher diploma, which is 46%, uh, MSc 11, uh, and uh, I mean, MSc is 43% uh, and 11% in the PhD programs. Faculty members, among all universities, we do have in engineering around 1,400 uh, and 31 faculty members. 73% uh, of them are PhD holders, 20% uh, MSc holders, and 7% as researchers are out of the PSC degree. The current research activities among different institutions in Jordan, this is according to SCOBUS 2008 and 2011. This is just for energy program, uh, uh, no, I mean engineering program. Uh, this is a list of universities where we have just Jordan University of Science and Technology, 705. Uh, publication, University of Jordan 620, etc., Balka University, all of these are universities. Now, what's interesting about this table, I tried to find publications belong to research institutes. <coughs> I couldn't find. So, we have in Jordan different research institutes. Their job is to do research, but without publication. Now, if we go to kind of research, type of research that we usually conduct on renewable energy, this is the percentage that we find. 60% of the publications they are talking about solar thermal application, BV around 25%, wind less than 10%, biomass, etc., etc., etc. So we have uh, feasibility and uh, evaluation, uh, which is a very uh, minimum uh, or very low percentage in our research activities. Now, with this, I establish the case that we do have potential researchers, we do have students, we do, we do have experience, some experience in conducting research and development activities among, you know, the universities in Jordan. Now, I will establish the case about research activities and research points, priorities of research. Now, the main challenges of energy sector in Jordan, which has been then done in 2007, is as you brought all know that almost no ambiguous energy resources, high dependency on imported energy, a high cost. Actually, last year, uh, 2011, it cost about 2.8 billion JD, uh, which comprised about 20% of the gross domestic product, high growth of primary energy demand. Features Jordan is a hub, and we have energy resources, oil, shale, uranium and we do have absolutely uh, renewable energy resources such as solar and wind. <coughs> now, when the energy strategy in Jordan established in 2007 to 2020, the main purpose of the strategy was diversifying the energy resources, increasing the share of local resources to the energy mixing. These of course are basics, actually. Enhancing environmental protect uh, protection, and this will be achieved through maximizing the utilization of the domestic resources that include solar, wind energy, and uranium. Expanding the development of renewable energy, generating electricity from nuclear energy, applying energy conservation measures. Now, based on that, the energy strategy in Jordan 
established in a way that we will have renewable energy by 2015 contributes 7% to the energy mix in Jordan. Now we are in 2012 and we are two, three years away from 2015 and the percentage that we have it today is less than 1%. And that strategy started in 2007. And we are now in 2012, three years away from 2015. We have less than 1% of that. So we have a problem. We, the, the, the strategy looks nice, the pie chart looks nice. The argument of uh, putting the strategy are nice, but you know the achievement is still we do have a problem with that. Now in 2020, the problem is even worse. The strategy says that the <coughs> renewable energy should contribute to 10 percent of the total energy mix in Jordan. And that was actually an ambitious strategy. Uh, and this is the actually modified strategy. The first strategy was 20 percent. But you know, after negotiation, they reduced it to, 20, uh, to 10 percent. Now going to the investment that we need to do in Jordan in order to supply or, or to guarantee that demand, to cover the demand in 2020, uh, it is expected to invest between 14 to 18 billion dollars over the next coming years from 2012 to 2020 in order to cover this strategy. Now, 11% of this should go to renewable energy. We are talking about 1.5 to 2 million, a billion dollars in the next coming years. So, we need, based on this, to move toward implementing the Jordan strategy in order to achieve the 10% now, sources of scientific uh, uh, research funding in Jordan, we have national funding resources. As an example, I, I wrote JUST, which is, this is the statistics from last year. JUST invested 1.8 million JB last year on research activity. <coughs> Now, the resources of fund are SRF, Scientific Research Support Fund. This belongs to Ministry of Higher Education. Higher Council of Science and Technology, there is a fund. Resources, internal funding, each university uh, has its own internal funding. Just uh, last year, they spent 1.3 million JD on research. By the way, this number looks moderate for you, but for Jordan, this number is, you know, it's a huge number for the university to support research activities within the university, about 1.3 billion. JRE, which is Jordan Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Fund, this is a fund which was established through the uh, Renewable Energy Law. Uh, it's a new fund. It's supposed to uh, support research activities in the renewable energy system. I don't think that there is money now in the fund. That fund, uh, private sector. We have some examples of private sectors where they support some research activities, uh, and we do have the international fund, EU, USA, and so on. Just last year, earned around uh, half million uh, JD, which is half million. Uh, uh, dollars, uh, I mean half a million euros to support research funds uh, from external, uh, I don't think this is my presentation, but anyhow, I will, this is in Arabic. This is scientific research support fund. Now, <coughs> we said that we need research activities, we do have researchers, we need this fund this is a fund which is, some of it yeah, is available either internally or externally. Now, we, uh, I would like to present, you know, the main source of funding in Jordan, which is SRSF, uh, which is simply 
the uh, purpose of that what you see uh, from A to I think 10 uh, objectives of that fund. The first three is about research activities. The first three is about research activities. Now, again, this slide is not meant to read it, but anyhow, priority list for research activities in energy in Jordan. This is a priority list for research activities. Uh, this is the some of the uh, uh, priorities. If we notice that on the right hand side, I marked the word development. This is not research activity, actually those are development activities. And this is support from the fund. So in summary, I would say that we do have in Jordan some researchers. They need capacity building, of course. What we need, research topics. We do have research topics of importance to Jordan economy. Uh, we have strategy, whether we agree with it or not, but we have a strategy that we need to implement. But in general, we have lack of focus. Uh, facilities and infrastructure, definitely we don't have that kind of facility and infrastructure to do quality research. And that's why I always in any conference say and I try to convince Dune to put infrastructure need for the MENA area. In order to do quality research, we need to build infrastructure within the MENA, uh, MENA area, and that will help spreading the desert tech concept in the MENA, MENA area, because at the end of the day, we need the desert tech concept to be a win-win situation. Win-win for the companies, and win for the countries that will implement the uh, power of the CSP system or whatever system that. Now funding, we need to allocate more money and more funding, but at the most important thing we, that we need to reorganize ourselves in order to manage the money, in order to produce or to gain maximum benefit to Jordan from that money. So this is effectively what I said. What's next? We need to specify research direction and manage funding resources. Building national research laboratories in order to build an infrastructure. One of the problems with the research fund that we are uh, uh, doing now is it is scattered and distributed. Like someone in the north want to do experiment about CSP. He has to buy equipment, sit, make a setup, and do that research. Now, after six months, someone from Mokta University want to do the same activity, but, you know, looking at different perspective from the system. Then he has to buy the system, build it, spend some money, and look at the different point. We need those systems to be collected in one place, which is called National Research Laboratory. It belongs to the... Jordan government, it belongs to one unit, and any researcher want to do research in that, go and do that research in that laboratory. This is, we manage the money. Uh, I uh, actually do have three proposals. One, uh, to build research laboratory for the PV, concentrating on the power electronics of the PV systems, solar thermal applications, including CSP technology, wind technology. Those are three different national research centers. We need to put an energy research roadmap with a, a system that measures the success of our project. And we need to enhance or do some system enhancement like some council, some organization, some temporary organization or council. Its objective is to uh, organize the R&D in renewable energy for two or three years and then leave the system working by itself. Uh, we need it has coordination among researchers, industries, government bodies, uh, and uh, NGO. We need to talk to each other in order to uh, improve this system and 
we need to do some enhancement with or better cooperation with inter international systems. Uh, with this, I conclude my presentation. Thank you, Dr. Sohel. Uh, any questions? Okay, by that we conclude our session for this afternoon. Uh, on my behalf and your behalf, we will thank, we'll be thanking Dr. Oli, Mr. Uh, Mouloudi, and Dr. Sohel. Thank you.